You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the 34th edition of the Center Steer Podcast. I am your host here, John Costage, from wonderful North Huntington, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh. Today is unseasonably warm for the last day of January 2000. Freakishly warm. It's like 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. 62. Is it 62 Fahrenheit? Well, growing up as a kid in Minnesota, th- this would have been a 100 degrees warmer than a typical weekend this time of year. <laughs> Uh, it, last weekend here in the, this area, we had I got eight, eight inches of snow while DC got uh, a foot and a half. Uh, I had a foot. Did you? Yeah. And you're okay. Yeah, you don't live too far away from me either. And uh, but we had eight inches. But now it's almost all gone. Uh, joining me in the studio today is I'm Harold and and Dave Carroll. Dave, what did you drive today? I drove my 2015 Ram instead of my Discovery. Your brand new Dodge Ram diesel. Yes. Very nice. We'll hear about that I, a little I later. I love a truck that comes with instructions. On the side, it says Ram. On the front, it says Dodge. No, no. <laughs> mine says Ram everywhere. Oh, well played. I haven't heard that one before. That's good. All the way from, <laughs> from Vermont. <laughs> Hey, I'm Morgan. Uh, it's been unseasonably warm here as well. We actually didn't get really any of your snow. No, because it, it came up. The, it sucked. came from the south, and, and, and yeah, we got a couple inches. That was it. And even today, it's like 50 degrees out. Well, there you go. The Green Mountain State. Yeah, still green. I'm still, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> and, and still mountainous. And our guest today is uh, Craig Dutton. Craig is a South African who currently is in Europe. Uh, say hi, Craig. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. Welcome for well, welcome to the show, and thanks for joining us. Do, yes, absolute pleasure. Do you mind revealing where you are? Are you in so? A- not at all. I'm uh, currently sitting in Ireland. I will be uh, here for another week or so, and then I am heading off to Scotland, uh, hunting down Land Rovers. And you are the, uh, I guess, organizer, uh, uh, producer of My Land Rover Has a Soul. Yeah. And we'll- yeah. So I'm the. I'm the photographer, really, that uh, that, that kind of uh, started Land, My Land Rover Has a Soul. And um, I am also the organizer of the Landy Festival in South Africa, which was the baby child of My Land Rover Has a Soul. And that is all a teaser because you've got to listen to the re- to more of the show until we actually talk to Craig and we'll talk more about that. Is that was that a good teaser? Did we do well? <laughs> Perfect. We don't usually plan the teaser, so that was. Uh, I'm very excited about. I'm that. feeling sufficiently teased. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that's a good, good opportunity to move into the news. Uh, <laughs> and Craig, as uh, as always, we like our guests to participate. So at any time, add in your your thoughts and your ideas. Um, oh, I do want to know before we get started. What 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 do you drive? I'm driving a P38 uh, Range Rover diesel. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's nice. my favorite little car. Excellent. Do you say little car? Yeah. <laughs> I never thought P thirty eight were that little. That's actually not little. <laughs> well, certainly not in terms of the headaches they cause. That's yeah, true. You're right. Yes. Yeah, they are high well, maintenance. But, but if we'll you get one that's that. good, you know, get, get 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 what? If you get one that's good, get one that's what? Yeah, well, there's a got to be a few out there, right? So <laughs> it, when they I'm left an the factory, maybe. Automobile sales in the United States for 2015 were a record. Uh, 17.4 million brand new vehicles were sold over the course of the year. That uh, barely beats the previous record of t- in the year 2000. So 17.4 million brand new vehicles sold in the United States. And it's uh, nice to say that uh, Land Rover was at the top of the list thanks to uh, uh, excellent sales of SUVs, crossovers, and trucks. Uh, Land Rover was up. This is December to December. So between December 14 and December 15, Land Rover sales were up 46.7%. Uh, Volvo was up almost 90%, and Jeep was right below Land Rover at uh, 42%. little side note, Bentley was up 41%. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, towards the bottom, uh, Jaguar was down 28%. And just in hard numbers... Uh, Land Rover sold uh, 8,441 vehicles here in the United States in December 15, and they sold 5,754 units December of 14. 
Uh, overall, it helped uh, JLR uh, up 29.6%. So as a company, they were the best company uh, for December in sales, uh, as percentage of you know increase in sales. Apparently on the backs of the Land Rover portion of the company. Clearly, clearly. Yeah, JAG uh, sold uh, 1,200 units compared to Land Rover's 8,400 8, units. Hey, they beat out Smart, so... Did they even, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, Smart was at six six nine. Yeah, I th- I don't think they're supporting that anymore. That was a Mercedes uh, joint, wasn't I, it? I gotta say, it makes no sense in this country to own one of those things. It <laughs> made it made sense in a, in a, if it was a city that that and you only went around in a city like New York. And right, that where was you had it. a lot of con- uh, congestion and a need to park something really tiny. Because, yes, because the you know the the cost of it relative to the economy, it didn't make sense. I mean, you could get something twice as big with with the same or better fuel economy for right. the same money. And then I also think uh, you know Zipcar and then Uber and Lyft have all probably made that even less of a need to have a, that small car, even if it was small and cheaper to operate. But right, now because just, you can just not own a car relative to yep. owning one small enough to get around town. You just yep. don't have to own one. And uh, further news. Uh, so last month, I believe, was the first full month for diesels by Land Rover here in the U.S. And I found some specific numbers, and I thought we'd share those. Uh, Land Rover sold 417 Range Rover Sport diesels, and they sold 387 Range Rover diesels, just the full Range Rover diesels. And that was, again, for December 15. Uh, As a comparison, uh, right, uh, and this is just by units, right above them was the Grand Cherokee diesel, 420 units, so the Range Rover Sport almost beat that. Uh, However, it didn't come close, and Dave um, helped out. Uh, the number one truck diesel sale in the U.S. was at coming in at 4,531 units, the Ram pickup. Thanks, for, thanks for helping out, Dave. Yeah, well. Well, the diesel <laughs> makes a lot of sense in a big truck. Indeed, indeed. Well, they're selling diesels in their half-ton line now, too. Yeah, and that's and, helping their numbers, definitely, because you used to have to buy a three-quarter or bigger to get one. Well, but it's a different diesel. Yeah. It's a uh, three liter that they've purchased from Mercedes, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah. The same three liter that you get in like the ML and the GL. Mm. Well, it's still rather so how long? How long has the, uh, the Jeep diesel been on the market for then? The Grand Cherokee. I don't think that's been out. I think that's that this long. year. I think that was this and year. And that's the same diesel that they're putting in the Ram 1500, too. Which makes sense because they're so. the same, same manufacturer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, uh, they've, I know Jeep is increasing the number of models that have diesels. Uh, yeah. It's interesting they'd buy that engine and not use a Fiat. Well, they're buying the Cummins for the bigger trucks. Well, yeah, but they have access to a good small diesel in the Fiat. Why wouldn't they use that? I bet you they started development before it's they Fiat got sold. It's Fiat and good. Mm-hmm. And they might have had that. that uh, might, might have been part of the deal, too, You know, when they, when they uh, got sold off to what ended up being Fiat. Maybe Mercedes already had their hook in because, remember, yeah, they used to own could be. A lot of that stuff, you know, because it takes five, you know, usually five, six years in a development cycle. Right. That's, that's a good question. Uh, so, uh, it, yeah, so Land Rover seems to be going strong. Uh, just to refer you back to the numbers of uh, that they sold in, in total units. So I remind you that in December, they Land Rover sold 8,441 units. And the uh, diesels, uh, when you add it up between the Range Rover and the Range Rover Sport, was about 900 units. So, so about eleven percent. About eleven percent. There's your there's you doing doing the math and uh, more or less. So that's I think a strong good start, uh, especially considering uh, you know with especially considering that um, you know Volkswagen's having its issues and and you know they didn't sell any diesels. Uh, in, They're on hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Craig. I see it already. That's quite funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I own one too. That's uh, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, uh, not everyone's perfect. That's true. That's true. Well, in this country, the number of choices for a small car with a diesel engine are pretty slim. Really? Yeah. And it really is a good engine, despite the the legal trouble they're in. It's I still stand behind the engine as being a good design. Well, it's not. But even even the problem is not the engine; it's the right. exhaust. It's the know. it's the emissions control right. system, which is always you know. Yeah. It's always there. It's always an issue. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, you just... Well, that's the thing. You know, back in South Africa, we, um, we, the, those uh, VW diesels, were, they've been out for a decade, and uh, they really are great motors, and we don't really give a rat's about uh, emissions down that side of the world. So, um, you yeah. know, 
this this whole nonsense didn't really affect um, the South Africans as much as what it affected uh, you guys in the in the first world. Well, and it's it's less the actual emission issue. It's I think it's more the fact that they lied about it because yeah. they they said it's fine, it's taken care of, and yeah, and it's the they, maneuvering and the mm-hmm. deception that's the real problem. I think that's the and, and the reality of it is the system they designed it you know, really is a pretty elegant system, and it and it did the job when it was allowed to operate. It's the fact that they kept turning it off that's the real yeah. issue, right? Yep. So it's really come, kind of down to the lying and the cheating, really. Yeah. And they knew about it. It's not yeah. even like they cheated for a year or two while they try to fix it. It was, well, I'm doing this for six yeah. years. Let's keep going. But the end result is it's eroded, eroded uh, consumer confidence. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Yeah. And, and and I also miss out on they were just bringing the four-wheel drive version of the Jetta to the to the market. And it was, it was like, that would, to me would have been killer. Four-wheel drive, sport wagon, TDI. Oh. Yeah. But, yeah, except that it would have slowed the car down. That's the only issue I have with it. That all-wheel drive soaks up a lot of horsepower. Yeah. Okay, it would have been cool. It would have been. It would have been I would have liked to find out because I could. You know, we could have done a lifted version and. and <laughs> <laughs> Along the lines of the diesels, uh, the BBC Auto section did a review of the Range Rover TD6 and the Sport TD6, and the headline, which you'll see in the show notes, is called "Can Land Rover Redeem the Diesel?" Which to me is kind of a misnomer because the article is just really a review of the North American version of the uh, of, of the of the diesels. And uh, that's a headline. Sounds to me like a head tilt towards the Volkswagen scandal. Clearly, yeah, mm-hmm. it was to bring people in. But they they you know if you read it, they really liked it. It was good. It was quiet. All the things we've talked about and heard about before. And they've all uh, the reasons for buying a Volkswagen five years ago. Indeed, and they referenced that smooth, quiet, powerful. And they they re- they reference that here by talking about the emissions and you know, they uh, Land Rover uh, you know is quick to note that a diesel engine uh, TD6 is admirably clean a low pressure a low pressure exhaust gas recirculation system reduces the volume of toxic gases producing produced during combustion and exhaust gas urea injection breaks down the NOx emissions into harmless nitrogen and water so, which is what VW was supposed to do I suppose that's what they all do yeah and VW. Well, they turn it on and off, right? Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> Volkswagen had come up with a way to not have to use the diesel exhaust fluid, which I, I like the notion of that. It's just, I, and I think the real the reality of why they turned it on and off was for longevity. I think the system worked, but maybe it wouldn't have lasted the hundred thousand miles. Mm, okay. Uh, for comparison to uh, Dave's uh, uh, Ram. Uh, the TD the TD six gets a combined cycle of twenty eight miles. Oh, I'm sorry, twenty eight miles on a highway and twenty five miles per gallon uh, combined. And so there you go. And, and it tows how much? I don't know if they mentioned towing here. Yeah, but it does have <laughs> eight hundred and sixty five foot pounds of torque. Uh, uh, the in stock trim in stock, yes, stock without this has four, it or this has four hundred forty four four hundred forty three pound feet of torque. That's, that is impressive. That is good yeah. for a small engine. So, so for perspective, I can tell you that our friend Bob, who owns the Ford Raptor, mm-hmm. it has 410 horsepower and 435 foot-pounds of torque. Well, that's a gasoline engine. That's a gas engine. So, Well, and this diesel, they even compare it to the V8, the Range Rover V8, and they said it's uh, 18 pound-feet less than the 5-liter supercharged V8. So the TD6 yeah. compared to the supercharged and twice V8. the fuel economy, and probably yeah, at least probably yeah, the, the three liters. Uh, I, I don't think they have the fuel economy in that one, but yeah, if you have to ask, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a Range Rover too. If you have yeah, to, yeah, ask. if you have to ask, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's a it's a Range Rover Discovery. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Uh-huh. Oh, that's coming up. We didn't talk about that story yet. Uh, we yeah, will wait for it. Wait for it. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that is so it's diesels, uh, which. It sounds like we have the negative on you know, with Volkswagen, but uh, there's some positivity there on the if you're in North America and you can buy yourself. If you do buy a diesel, we want to know about it. Uh, maybe bring it down to Pennsylvania. Maybe we can drive it around. I'll take you to lunch. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, uh, JLR has uh, built a factory or has – they've had a factory for a while, but the, the, the Liverpool Echo – did a tour of the Halewood factory, and the car is rolled out every 80 seconds. And this is the factory. It used to be a Ford uh, factory years ago, and now they produce a Vox and Disco Sports. Uh, apparently, 
if I remember correctly, the Halewood is where they, they were making the uh, uh, X-Type, the rebadged Ford Mondeo. Oh, okay. That I could be wrong, but I think that's where they were making that, and that's where they started the transition from Ford to Jag. Yeah, it's not meant. I just they just mentioned in this article there was a, for, a for, former Ford factory. Ancient history in automotive world today. Yeah. So apparently, so the car comes out about every eighty seconds, and it takes uh, forty eight hours to produce a car. So you know, that's the, quite a few in progress. Yes, it is, and I'm sure it's. I suspect they're not doing three shifts around the clock. I suspect it might be one or two shifts, but yeah. they didn't. That's not clear here. But they do employ a good number of people. Forty two hundred people uh, are employed directly on site by JLR. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's a, there's a plant they're producing, and that's uh, probably if you get a Disco Sport, I suspect that's where they come from. Uh, but if you want to, and, oh, yeah, go out, check the show notes and get the link to the article, and you can, there's a video tour. That's the main point of this. Uh, you can take a look at a behind-the-scenes look at the, at the factory. I think it's uh, just three or four minutes. But. And we'll get to the Defender later, but obviously that's a much better production rate than the, the Defender, well, you're considering not. they only just hit $2 million. Well, you're not bolting the bulkhead by hand and setting the panel gaps by hand. And, and you weren't running one shift. True. Just don't forget that you know, they only started ramping up to three shifts in the last year because to, just to meet the demand for the end of the line. But we should, yeah, we can hold that, too. The difference is Halewood probably employs the same number of people in three shifts that, that uh, Solihull did in one. Yes, I, they probably employ, and they also employ... Uh, as you know, uh, three times as many robots as they do people to, right. to make it. Whereas the Defender was there was uh, like three robots total, and that usually was just a conveyor to move the thing down. Right. It was all hand built. So. Uh, moving to the United States, uh, JLR has announced an inaugural startup uh, for their tech incubator. Apparently, they have some sort of office or incubation uh, technological incubation uh, facility in Portland, Oregon. And uh, they're working with, uh, I guess, the Silicon Valley types. Uh, I read the article. <laughs> I'm still not exactly sure what's happening. <laughs> I mean, are, are they, is this just a new line of business for them? Are they trying to encourage uh, automotive technology innovation or, or, or just general technology? Uh, I think it's general technology because something it looks. Uh, the article here says uh, this is from Forbes. This inaugural class includes the wearable business baby bit. Parking information provider Parkit and Urban Systems, a company in the electric electric vehicle infrastructure space. Yeah. So I think well, it's, it still sounds somewhat like it's it's tied to the automotive industry. I think so. That would make sense. Why would you go out of your lane? They typically don't go out of their lanes either. At least I've seen from Jag. Yeah, that would be a serious diversification for them if they were. Yeah. So. And they already do quite a bit of you know R and D for the technology side of of Land Rover developments. I mean, we've seen all of the invisible bonnet and invisible trailer stuff. You can remote control your Range Rovers, so. Where is my phone? It must be upstairs. Yeah, I could remotely <laughs> could remotely control my I could Can I control my uh, 109 and have it go? I'm not sure you can control your 109 when you're behind the wheel. <laughs> Truth, Dave. Truth. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Dave. <laughs> I, I can attest to that one. <laughs> I'm not sure anybody can control that thing at times. You, you can, however, use your phone to locate the keys for the one on. I can. I can use that to locate the keys. Uh, speaking of keys, a man was trapped in his uh, Range Rover, and I'm using uh, quotes, and you'll explain why in a moment, because the vehicle went into super lock mode. This happened in San Juan Capistrano in California. And it's, I, want, I have to read this on purpose. It took Orange County firefighters about half an hour today to free a man from his 2001 Range Rover Discovery 2. <laughs> it went into super lock mode when he was inside the vehicle. Uh, I'm just annoyed, of course, that they called it a Range Rover Discovery because all my friends tell me, oh, how's that Range Rover? And I have to explain to them. And he's referring to the 109 at that point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the 109 is, is, a, is a Range Rover, yes. Um, about as non-Range Rover as they get. So apparently the, the the vehicle went into super lock mode. The firefighters came, and they thankfully another firefighter had the same kind of vehicle, explained what was going on, and he needed to have the key fob outside the vehicle. He climbed into the back. They opened up the hatch just enough to get the, the key fob out, and then they opened up the doors. You can flex the window frame enough to pass the key out on those things. I don't know what the— That happens naturally. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's how I get into them when they get locked. 
<laughs> Indeed. Jack the window frame open, get in there with a long pointy stick and push the button. Oh, oh, you don't even need to do that. There's usually enough perforation in the rear seats, you know, in the rear seat wells on those. That you just, you know, put your hand well, up Well, that's the there. D1s more yeah. than the D2s, but yeah. yeah. There you go. So super lock mode, I, for those who aren't aware of it, the, the, the point of if my understanding of super lock mode is you lock the vehicle and then you go into the super lock mode, which I forget how that happens, but it disables the inside uh, door, door, handles. Oh, door handles. Right, so you can't open it from the inside. So if someone were to smash the window and then they couldn't reach in and, and then open it up. How, yeah. did, how does it get into super lock mode? Don't you have to hold it? Do you have to hold the button down? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can put it in super mo- lock mode from the oh, no, it's center. A, you turn the key, don't you? No. Don't you have to put the key in the door and turn it? You then, can. I think, yeah, if you, you, yeah, if you lock it three times. Twice or three times or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, is there a button? But that's not the button, though, right? If you, on your key fob, if you push that, does it go into super I, I lock mode? I think you can do that with the button also, pushing it. Yeah, and, and you can do it from the uh, the center. Center console? Yeah, the center console button, too. Oh, or you can probably achieve that function a couple of other ways if there's a malfunction in your, in your lock system, which may or may not be the issue. I'm here. sure that has to be what happened to the guy, because if you use the center console button when you're inside the vehicle, it will unlock it, right. whether it's in super lock mode or not. So either this guy had a malfunction or he was just an idiot. So, Well, perhaps he was working on it and had the dash <laughs> partly removed and the button was on the bench outside the vehicle at the time. Well, then he shouldn't have been driving it. Well, he sh- yeah, but yeah, this is the reason, number one, when, when vehicles come into my shop, that the window goes down before I get out of it. I will second that. Uh, I, I learned that in college. We had some, some Buicks given to us, and, and they would, as we called it, going Christine. You go to operate the thing, <laughs> you go to start it up, and immediately all the doors would lock, and then the vehicle would die, completely die, electrically shut down, and you're trapped in the vehicle. I hope you had one of those uh, window breakers. You need uh, those, no, uh, we would just you know wave wave somebody down who was walking through the shop yard at the time, and, <laughs> and they would open it from the outside. Yeah, it was still openable from the outside. Get that, but it, it's like it turned into the back seat of a cop car or something. But yeah, it's just <laughs> <laughs> it a childproof lock, the child lock system. Moving on to the best news I've heard in a long time relating to Land Rovers, the Freelander has now considered. A heritage vehicle. Is that the freeloader or the puke lander? Uh, see, you, you were waiting. You were just waiting to do this to me, weren't yes, you? Yes, I was. <laughs> uh, and so, I'm just thinking that's the nicest thing that could be said about a Series 1 freelander. Hey, it's, it's now classified as a heritage vehicle. So, they will, so that means that it will continue stocking spare parts, 9,000 different components uh, for the recently discontinued model. Because it's no longer a contemporary vehicle. So well, what go. is tragic about this is that it's going to her- encourage people to keep their Freelanders. Well, well, <laughs> I was going to say, Harold, you, you had one in your driveway until recently, and a mishap. Uh, oh, yeah, we've discussed resulted it. in its destru- destruction. Well, yeah, so it do- apparently you, you could have Freel- resurrected it. Apparently, Freelanders do not like chimneys falling <laughs> upon them. I don't know any cars that like chimneys falling on them. <laughs> Well, they are. There well, it's is easier that. to recover from that problem in a, in a series truck, for instance, than it would be in a Freelander. True, true. So the Freelander will join the Range Rover, Dis- Disco, Series 1, Series 2, Series 3, and I guess Defender eventually, because I don't think Defender is on that list yet. But there you go. So all the mighty Freelanders, please step up. Uh, you are now a heritage vehicle. You know, I don't know. I don't know how big Freelander is um, in the states, but when I was at Billing uh, last year, you know, there's such a huge following for it, and uh, and it's still a Land Rover, and and the, the poor Freelander guys get such a bad bloody rap for this, and uh, I feel sorry for them because they they buy Land Rovers and they yeah. just. They're just so into it, and and let's hope they're going to go and buy themselves a series and 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 a defender thereafter. But uh, hey, we've got to give the, the Freelander guys a bit of a break. Well, I, I agree. I feel sorry for anybody who buys a Freelander thinking he's getting a Land Rover. <laughs> That's a shot at me. Don't worry, it's a shot at me. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Well, well, and ultimately, it doesn't matter because with with John, it wouldn't have mattered if it was a Freelander. <laughs> 
<laughs> We'd still be harassing him. John, oh, that's <laughs> true. That's true. I John provides him. so many opportunities I do. for picking on I him. I do. I do. Uh, Craig, my very first Land Rover was, in fact, a Freelander. They uh, came to the United States, and I got one of the first ones that came here, uh, and they... That was my entry. And the main reason I got it, to be candid, was I didn't have to put premium fuel in it. And because I really like, yeah, I, I, I like to disco. Yeah, a lovely but, reason. Well, and at the time, I didn't have the, the cash to just, you know, freely spend on fuel that was probably 3 or $4 a gallon, and then mm-hmm. premium was even more. And, and you hadn't really thought about doing the math on the life cycle cost. And when you get to 60,000 miles, you got to do a $3,000 timing belt change. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, those are things I didn't, didn't Versus know Versus going to 100,000 or the first time you blow a head gasket to do a timing chain for 100 bucks. And Yeah. Well, I didn't know Harold at the time. And uh, anyway, so, so uh, I would have set you straight. I know you would have, but that was my foray into it, and I liked it, and it was enjoyable, and uh, it, you know, it worked for you. And I it was, say. and it was also the it was the best selling vehicle in Europe, uh, and it was you know, Land Rovers. You know, that was that was making them money and keep them going. So, mm. and let's face it, compared to most of the other very small SUVs in the U.S. market. Uh, it was still probably the most capable. Well, and I think what helped there were very few. I think what helped them in Europe also was it was available with a diesel. Oh yeah, mm. and it was also utilitarian. It had that capability to have different styles and different models. People used it as a you know like a, almost like a transit van. You, you, they could use it for the family. They could get the smaller version if they wanted. If it was just them, so, and yeah. I think it was at a different price point in Europe too. So you could yeah. get it as a family station wagon. Whereas here, you really have to be into it to spend forty thousand dollars on on. It was thirty when I got. Mine was okay. thirty, well, but still what, still more than it should have been. Yes, well, because I, but I think Land Rovers positioned themselves here as a premium vehicle, and it was not necessary. I don't think the Freelander was ever a premium vehicle. Well, and it was conceived as an entry level, and it just yes. you, you couldn't quite do an entry level on a premium brand here. Right, it's difficult. Yeah, which I think that's what the it's, Disco Sports trying to do, to do is become that premium entry level vehicle. But there's also more competitors in the space too. Right, and they've educated people here uh, more than I think when they brought the Freelander in originally. Uh, I think the Disco Sport think... is in a better position to do that now than the Freelander was 15 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think uh, uh, Land Rover as a brand could ever um, try and push anything in as uh, as an entry level anything. It's it's a premium brand, and the moment you try and manufacture an entry level anything and a premium brand, you're just you're just asking for a lot of trouble and you know, a lot of uh, opening yourself up for a lot of. Um, uh, uh, a lot of flack. Right. Yeah. Well, you have to cheapen the product and, to the uh, point yeah. where you dilute the brand. Exactly. Well, exactly. Just, which I think so is what just, the just Freelander was premium. to me. That's what the, premium, the Freelander seemed to be. It was like the quality materials I thought wasn't there, and, they, that, and there were some neat design mm-hmm. things. But I mean, they were capable yeah. for what they were, but oh, yeah. you couldn't pound them the same way you no. could – a real Land Rover, and no. you know, for instance, you can't do a frame swap on a Freelander once they get right. rusty. Mm-hmm. You throw them away. Well, so Her- so Harold, how long would a Freelander have lasted with me? Ten minutes. That long? <laughs> not <laughs> off as long road. As, not as long as it did with John, but yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if you did try to treat one of your Toyotas the same way you treat your Land Rover, how long would that last? Oh, no, never. There you go. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't do anything to any vehicle. That I drive, other than my Land Rover, that I do to my Land Rover. Well, you, you, th- you think about it: a Freelander, a first-gen Freelander, is basically a British Toyota. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, but there's still a lot of them on the road, and and you won't find th- the same age vehicle, that many of the same age vehicles on the road as what you will Freelanders, because they still last as long or longer than many other vehicles of the same category. And they have parts available for them, which is part mm-hmm. of it, too. It's aluminum. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I think the undisgusting and unnoticed here in the United States is the Freelander 2, which they renamed to the LR2. There's still a lot of those on the road, and they, are, and they were mo- way more reliable than the original Freelander. That's because here. they were mechanically a Volvo. It, it, it doesn't matter. They were. St- there's still a lot on the road. They're still out there, and, I th- and that had kept them going. And uh, they, you know, they renamed it. But I'll, t- I'll tell you what. I kind of liked. Not the, noticed. I kind of. I kind of liked the Freelander too, LR two. I like. Uh, it, uh, 
I liked it less because it, it, I guess having had the first one and I really enjoyed it and I liked it and, you know, kind of fell in love with it, I suppose, because I think it has a soul. Uh, yeah, a little teaser again. Uh, but the two, I just, I, I don't know. It started getting to that. You, it looked like all the other, all, all the other trucks again to me. Uh, and I, the interior to, still wasn't up to that, what I thought a Land Rover premium was supposed to be. But I mean, it's, it's not bad. I, I would recommend that to someone who's looking to get into a, a Land Rover and, and they're not sure what they want or and it's a little cheaper. I think you, you pick up a good used uh, LR2 here. You know, you know, it still could be a decent car. And yeah. a decent car. And it's, it's a good oh. for like our temp, our zone of you know how much snow we get. That would probably be like a, almost a perfect vehicle. Because you know you just you need it occasionally. You don't and you need the all wheel. You don't need four wheel all the time. Yeah, and it also boils down to let's think about all, any four wheel drive. How often do you use it for its purpose intended? How many people buy a Range Rover and really take it off road? I, I was going to say, you know, it's. Do you want me to answer okay. that, or? <laughs> I think it's, it's more rhetorical, and we know we all know the answer. You know, and and Land Rover knows that too, which you know takes us into into dis, you know, discussing you know the end of the Defender line. Uh, you know, Land Rover knows this. They know how people use their vehicles and what they don't do with their vehicles. Well, I, well, the the difference is, I mean, because I mean, you could say the same thing about Discoveries as well. But but what it comes down to is that these vehicles don't get used a lot for their intended purpose until they become old. Right. So once you get a, a Discovery point. or a Range Rover that's right. 10, 12 years old, all bets right. are off, and you, you're starting to see well, them Well, then, on then the, people on the like trail. me buy them. Yeah, because they can afford to. Right, and, and yeah. they become a cheap sort of throwaway, you know, from a risk management standpoint, you can afford to it's take second that or third risk car. with them. And, yeah. and you can take the risks. Yeah. Well, well, see, that was my thinking originally. And, but I, let's face it, I'm still driving my first Disco. Of course, I own like three other ones. But <laughs> well, you, you have to to keep parts on your first. I want to, how many, how many original pieces are on that, that first one? The body's all original. <laughs> and, and it looks like it. <laughs> That's true. So wh- why don't we move into the big discussion? Uh, we say we're not going to have to talk a lot about it, but I wonder. Uh, Friday, January 29th is a 26, 2016. Yeah, we're in 2016. Uh, I. Haven't written a check yet. Uh, we'll go down in history as a as a sad day in Land Rover world when the production the Defender production came to an end. And uh, well, we could talk for eight hours straight on that. And no we problem. and we have we have yeah. Uh, you know, I, I guess the really the point here is to say that it production ended. Uh, I'll have some links to a couple of the stories that were out there if you're interested. If you don't already or aren't already aware. Or you want to read a little more about it? And I found a couple of interesting stories that I liked, um, and there was a lot of discussion. And it made the big news even here in the U.S. Uh, made general news. Um, now, now, did I read correctly that that the last uh, Defender off the line is going to the British Motor Museum? That is my understanding. the The final one that came off had a it, it looked exactly like the first one, the Yui, right. what they call Yui, and the plate was yeah, and the plate it was, was a similar. Huey plate. It, it's similar. It's instead like H199. Huey, well, instead of Huey 166, it's H166 Huey. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, it's yeah. a similar it's a resemblance. But it's I'm, as close as they could possibly get with modern number plate standards. Correct. And I believe this is going to the Motor Museum. Which that's, would be nice. It gives them a bookend because they have Huey. The exactly. Yeah. Right. But I believe it's going to be on a uh, – James May mentioned about they're going to be doing a big Land Rover thing on his – he has a show in the U.K. on – Sunday nights, I think it's tonight, or maybe it's tomorrow night, uh, Cars for the People, which we don't get here in the U.S., and uh, I guess he's going to do a big Land Rover thing. I think those two, I think both Yui's, if we call this the last one Yui also, went to him for his show. I went to the BBC because right, I saw yeah. a picture for that. Are you familiar with that, Craig? Have you seen that show? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I haven't. Uh, um, okay. uh, it's interesting that you mention it because there's obviously um, there are a few of that, those sort of personalities that I want to hunt down for the book. But uh, yeah. I'm not I'm not familiar I'm not familiar with the show. Um, I follow him on just, uh, Twitter, uh, James May. That is, and I follow him on Twitter, and he talks about this Cars for the People show, and apparently it's on BBC yeah. Two. I think Monday nights. They, and, they've put uh, a couple episodes of something like that on BBC America uh, in the past. I think they have, but it's sporadic. You know, yeah, they, yeah, it's they, a special thing. It's special. Thing, it's not yeah. a, re- a recurring show. Right. Yeah. 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 So. To answer your question, Harold, I believe it is going to the Motor Museum. It would make complete sense. Uh, that's what happened. You know, the last one looked a lot like the right. first one. You, it, I, I, I like that notion, too. It's, oh, it's, I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. So and, uh, uh, just coming back to the to the whole um, conversation about the, the end of Defender, 
it's my understanding that it's, this isn't the end of Defender. It's just the end of Defender production at Solihull. You know, obviously they they are launching, they're relaunching Defender in two years or whenever they actually get their act together on this. So it's not the end of Defender. It's, it's just the end of this era of Defender, is it not? The end Correct. of the Defender as we know it. Yeah. Well, let's. But the end of Defender as you knew it, well, the end of series as as we knew it, you know, that that, that caused its own set of problems. So there's always there's, people are always averse to to change, and obviously this is this is a big change, primarily because it's changing the manufacturing facility as well, which was obviously part of the heritage. I mean, every single Land Rover fanatic on the planet knows uh, or has heard of Solihull. So the fact that these things aren't being made at Solihull in the mall is anymore is quite um, sad, but it, it's not the end. Well, did you guys hear, and, and I don't know whether where I heard this from was credible or not, but they're taking Solihull, the factory, and they're going to start refurbishing series and yes, defenders. That is that is that true. I, I did hear that. But I think that's going to be – I suspect that's going to be a limited operation. Oh, I'm sure it will be. And there's but some, it's it's still – There's also to uh, kind of what – alluded to what Craig had mentioned. Uh, there is – you know, there's supposed to be – Land Rover, every time I saw their tweets and I saw the stories, it was always this is the last production of the Defender in Sully Hall. They, and, and you could, you know, yeah, you can read between the lines what exactly does that mean. Uh, there is – and then I've you know, read other things certainly uh, that indicate that maybe they're, they're yeah the Defender name will continue. The way that we know the truck has ended, the way it's been produced has ended. Which I would I will just generically say it was a manual production. It was hand built, and the new one's right. going to be not hand built. It's, it's it right. can't be uh, to meet the numbers that they want to meet because you know right now they were producing not last year take take the last year out. Uh, I think they were producing somewhere along the lines of ten or fifteen thousand vehicles a year, and that was it. And they were running one shift, uh, all hand built, and that was and you know, they were building all different kind of model types. Uh, the new one, Jerry McGovern uh, has said, you know, they need to produce. I think it's in the hundreds of thousands is what they want to get to, and um, well, that will result in a design that can be produced on basically any modern assembly line. They can build them anywhere, and, and that doesn't preclude them from retooling Solihull and making them there as well. Uh, uh, correct, but at, at some point in the future, I, I I think I I just get some feeling, and I and just reading between many lines, I think Solihull is going to become kind of a heritage location which i think would be cool i think would be kind of cool right. and i that there is discussion there's thought is that is the current line going to be dismantled and moved is the current line going to be turned into some sort of restoration and then maybe a heritage thing um the slovakia you know they they're going to build a plant in slovakia is that going to be the new location they have not said uh exactly it could be slovakia it could be there's a uh, in the, and there's a, a good article uh that i'm i'm referencing uh on i should mention it now uh, Land Rover owner international uh, Mike uh, Goldbun, I think, is their, their editor. Really nice article. I'll certainly have a link to it in the show notes. You know, is this the end? What's next for Defender? And you know, he, there's a plant near. I forget, I, I, I'm trying to read and, and talk at the same time. There's a plant in the UK that it might be used for that. Could they retool it? Um, things are coming out. The new model is supposed to be announced, I think, next year, and then they're looking at a 2017 uh, release, which would be the 70th, no, sorry, 18, maybe in model year 18, that would be the 70th anniversary of Land Rover, and I think that's what they're targeting, and that would be the new mm. one. I did find numbers, so I should read them. Uh, of the 400,000 or so vehicles Land Rover builds every year, only 15 to 20,000 are Defenders. Mm. So that was that's from that article. Land Rover says the next Defender needs to be capable of 600 to excuse me, 60,000 to 100,000 sales per year to wash its face. I'm not sure what that means. That's probably a British thing. Um, so, did I answer? I think that, that was answer some of your questions, Craig, of the things we've heard. Yeah, yeah. and that actually echoes um, a, an article that I, that I read in Land Rover Owner probably over a year ago, um, which was saying that they're only selling 10,000 odd right. uh, defenders, and it just is not financially feasible to keep these vehicles going, yep. uh, which is understandable. And I think the yep. world just needs to sort of uh, put their big boy pants on and get over it. And You sound like Jerry McGovern. <laughs> <laughs> He's a chief designer. He basically said the same things. Well, He's yeah, like, change happens, and that's, that's, that's right. the thing. Right. Well, and I mean, it happens in every single model across all brands, and everyone has a fit when a new, dynamically new shape comes out. 
I do think it is it's great that they've you know that Land Rover has put so much attention into you know a, the the ending of the production, just showing mm-hmm. off exactly how much the heritage all ties together and and making you know a big event out of it. Yeah, I don't you know, think they could have done the send off any better. Yeah, Agreed. and but you you've got to give kudos to um, I think to the marketing team for that because. Um, you know, Land Rover is a heritage brand, and if they hadn't, um, if they hadn't sort of uh, uh, noticed that uh, or taken note of it and used it in their send off to to build a platform for the next vehicle, that would have been silly. I know you say that, uh, but I tend to think and this is my personal opinion. I don't think Jerry McGovern, who's the designer, I don't think he cares about heritage. Uh, I think they just did it because he had to, and I don't. I, you know, he was in some of the pictures, and I saw him there. But his comments over the years, and this is even referenced in that LR article, is you know the current Defender has never sold on its design. Uh, what, what's he thinking? Yeah, well, and has changed that's why very, I call him clueless, Jerry. And has changed very little over the years. What we are working on is something that will be more desirable to look at. He, I, more he, desirable for him to look at. He's maybe. completely. I agree. He's completely clueless, and and, you, you, and uh, he, I don't think he gets it. I don't think Jerry thinks it's a heritage company. They they're looking to sell units, and they're you know. And I think it was up to him. This is, again my opinion. I think it was up to him. They would have shut the line down two years ago, and he would have said, "You're getting a new Defender. Suck it up. It's going to look like the DC 100, and yeah, that's life." Well, I, I think he he basically you know he's arrogant enough that he doesn't like anything he didn't design. It's very possible. Yeah, that's very possible. I, yeah, and but I mean, I, you know, not to not to bash his designs necessarily. I think he's done some interesting products in the past, but you know, he's not the be all and end all. No, no. Well, and design should service the 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 theme of I think of the vehicle and the theme of the mark. And uh, I don't know. We'll see if it happens. Now, reading on in this article, maybe to, to bring that up uh, if I can find it while I'm talking. Uh, and there's not a lot of people talking. They're really good at the at the security and the secrecy on what's coming up. But the things that, that LRO has heard LRO, uh, has heard is that the new model's coming. Uh, it's pretty much I, maybe I'm going to put a number on it, like 80% done, and people are going to like it. They say well, it's not, and it's not the DC 100 too. I should say. Well, say and that's that. fine. And I think ultimately it's going to be a nice vehicle. And you know, just my observation is. You don't necessarily have to call it a defender. What's wrong with de- with retiring that name like they do with with uh, baseball players? Retire the jersey, retire the number. Well, you know, if you look at at the relative success that uh, Beetle had when they relaunched their Beetle, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's been a massive success, but it's been relative success. And there are many other brands out there that are are now starting to yep. rejuvenate um, the old models and I, I don't think um this is not quite a rejuvenation but why why kill a uh, a model that's actually iconic and going going well well you, know, the, you the, you'd have to rebrand and re and remarket a, a, a con- entirely new vehicle oh it's like the defender but it's now this i, I don't think they, that could they be did a good, a good job when they introduced the defender name that was something straight out of the blue Agreed. Remember how many freaking series models? Series twenty three. You know, you, you, you got to get over that at some stage. You know what <laughs> right, I mean? Right. Right. Uh, the defender did a good job with that. And the 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 point I'm trying to make is, if you are a company driven by heritage and and a heritage company, why would you want to take this iconic heritage name and apply it to something that really shares none of that heritage with what came before it? But do we know that it shares none of the heritage? Well, I okay. think it's going to be. Along the lines, I think the only things that they're really needing to do is address shape, safety. Um, I don't believe the um, the emissions. There's a lot of talk about emissions. I think that's a lot of crap. Um, oh, I agree. Why it's would covered. you? You know, you can just change a motor and sort out the exhaust, and your emissions sorted. Um, right, emissions is a non-issue. I think the yeah, real, I, but it's but it's so often it's so often uh, uh, quoted. I think emissions, it's, emissions. Uh, it's not. It's it's safety. I think it's a, um, a cover story. One, it's uh, one of the big yeah. production costs, too. I think, I think there's production costs, and they're leaving money on the table in the United States because it is not available here, 
and they are yeah. and they're and well, and, that, and that's purely emissions. No, that's no purely it's safety. It's safety because it's, safety, cause it's the well, airbag. Yeah. It's the airbag. You can make that's emissions true. pass. It's it's the yeah. safety. It's stuff. a safety. But they're leaving money on the table, and and that's not all of it. But I think this is a good part of it. I think the safety and emission issues in the in the in Europe was used as a cover. As, as cover. No, it's not all of it, but it's a little bit of cover. And they wanted to. They're leaving money on the table. They're doing very well as we ta- as we talked at the beginning of the show. They're do- selling very well in the United States. It's I think their number one market. China's I think number two and and up and coming. And they they're and that name has great cachet here, as we know, because you know, models here sell for three, four, five, ten thousand times what they sold for when they were new, right. even though they have a hundred thousand miles on them, and they're falling apart. Uh, there's so money in rusty old trucks. There's money in rusty old trucks, and Land Rover's not getting that money, and they and and rightfully so, they should come for it. Why not? We would love the name, you know, and would, and more trucks here would be good for us. Uh, if the know. truck was was up to the name, that's the problem. And we will find yeah. out. No, it, yeah. it really just comes down to what they give us. Yes, which goes to uh, if I in the article that uh, from LRO, this is probably a good good opportunity for this. Uh, this is uh, his checklist for what the next defender sh- must have and mustn't have, and I'll just read through these quickly, and then we can talk about it. Uh, you know, it must have best off road articulation, approach and departure angles, a uh, range of body styles to suit all user requirements, slim as a current model, a range of torquey engines, three and a half ton, British number, uh, towing capacity, best in class on road performance and handling, and ability to personalize the current model, like the current model. Mustn't have rakish looks leading to poor visibility, especially when driving off road. Uh, easily dented, shouldn't have, easily dented body panels that don't wear damage well. Don't, shouldn't have, need Needless complexity that compromises reliability and durability in the field, and mustn't have a twenty-five thousand pound plus VAT minimum price tag, which would be forty, about maybe forty grand here. Um, so those are his checklists of things that it shouldn't and should have. Uh, I will add to that a little bit uh, in his comment about a range of body styles. I think part of what makes a defender a defender is not so much just the range of body styles, but the fact that you can change those body styles on a whim. You can put a hard top on it for the winter. You can unbolt that hard top and put a soft top on it for the summer. You can change from a pickup to a station wagon with a little bit of work. Are you going to be able to get that, though, in a modern vehicle with the, you know, if they use the way they have the frames and the bodies integrated? And, well, you know, I think having rigidity. it remain body on frame versus being unibody, I think, mm. is key also to the utilitarian high strength nature of the Defender. And I think that needs to stay as well. But, you know, it is possible to make that change. I think there is some compromise uh, relative to safety, but it's still doable. Yeah. In fact, Jeep does that currently with their their line of of their most, I can't remember the, which is it, the JK? Yeah, the I JK think. Unloaded. Um, yeah, so you can get that um, soft top or hard top, and the hard top is removable. Um, and in fact, while it's not direct from Jeep, um, you can get pickup truck conversion kits for them. Yes. So it's it's doable. Well, yeah, I think it, I think it really. It's um, it's a function of um, whether or not Land Rover themselves want to um, acknowledge this heritage and and all the and all these these things that are important to us Defender Land Rover people um, versus what's important to them, which is ultimately rands and or uh, not rands and cents dollars. Um, and I've seen that quite often, having dealt with various uh, Land Rover. At, at, at head office level, and um, sadly, it's to them. It's about selling widgets and not selling Land Rovers. And whether or not that filters down into the design and ultimately the, the end product is an, uh, you know, it's another thing to be just seen. But it's it's a very disheartening thing to to recognize that when you're going to when you go into various uh, and meet various head office people so you're saying that you've you've met with the upper level jlr folks and that's well, what you're thinking met, yeah i've met with with um with with upper level jlr folk in south africa so okay. the 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 distribution side of things and um you know they they speak heritage when it's important to speak heritage and when they need to sell widgets based on heritage, but they are widget sellers. 
they could be selling freaking Toyotas or <laughs> whatever it is. They right. just don't care. All they need to do is sell numbers. Um, and I've just noticed that probably over the last four years, I've started to notice that more and more um, they, they've had staff turnover and that staff turnover has, has generated widget sellers and not Land Rover sellers. It's quite sad. It's actually incredibly frustrating to deal with it as a person who's a person who's like incredibly passionate about the brand. You walk in there and you got all this passion, and they are like, "Yeah, well, you know, let's talk money, let's talk widgets." Well, that, hap- that happens. That happens here too, because here you you, yeah. you drive an, even an old disco into your local dealership, and they'd rather you not. Yeah, we 100%. showed up at a dealer event in your one ten. They didn't know what it was. Oh, I know. They didn't yeah. know what it was, literally. I know. I know. They didn't want to know what it was. Yeah. I have to tell you I have to tell you a little story. So so I get to this uh this meeting for for my my event and we, and I have Land Rover there the um what was she? She was the sponsorship manager or something to that effect. I don't remember her name. And um we're sitting around and we're discussing a, a their stand at my event, and she was saying, "Yeah, oh, no, what we want to do is we want to have the uh, like father, like son uh, uh, image. We had the the um, it was the Range Rover Sport or the new Range Rover and the and the classic, um, like the adverts." And she was saying, oh, "I'm really battling to get the uh, a classic Land Rover." And I said, "Well, why don't you just get a Defender in a series?" And she said, "A series of what?" And I said, a series? <laughs> a series? And she says, I heard you the first time. A series of what? <laughs> I was like, okay. Now wow. I know what I'm dealing with, yeah? Yep, answered everything right there. Yep. Yeah, That's and it was just – I, I was sitting with the Land Rover Owners Club uh, guy, and and he he looked at me like, uh, yeah, okay, what are we dealing yeah. with here? Right, right. Well, open palm, insert face. Yeah. <laughs> Although you know, things we've heard from some of our other guests over over the years is that the the folks at at Sully Hall, those upper level guys, at least the ones this was a couple of years ago and even to now, some of them at least still understand heritage and they understand the line. Uh, hmm. You know, we've had Graham Aldis on who uh, who did the uh, LR sixty five video, and he you know he knows Roger Cranthorn and although Roger just uh, retired uh, from uh, Land Rover, his discussion was those guys still understand heritage and even jeff aronson who has is the editor of rovers magazine here in the u.s you know he says that they understand heritage and understand that so there's at least maybe the thought is that the higher at the super high levels there there might still be some some of that left but maybe it doesn't translate down to the uh, into the sales side but well i think once well, those people retire you're you're gonna have a hard time and finding. as those people retire we got more and more problems yeah yeah, I, I think that's why it's it's so partially so impressive that the marketing department has done so well there. The, oh, the marketing have... department has been able to hold on to that, whereas all the other departments have sort of let that get lost. I think I think that's it, and and and, and I think like we were saying earlier on, it, it's the it's the wisdom within the marketing department that has identified it and 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 probably force it back. You know, saying, guys, we can't sell these things if you're not addressing heritage because your entire brand is built on heritage. Oh, it's their greatest asset, without a doubt. Yeah. Although I might say, number, you know, their sales are not going down with what they're not doing. So we don't think they're focusing enough on heritage, but sales are not going down. They're doing well, mm-hmm. at least here in the U.S. So that is not going to the, affect. The question is, would they have gone up as much if they hadn't been focusing on heritage? Well, they don't have the Defender here in the U.S. They're putting, leaving, that goes to my point, they're leaving money on the table. What, you know, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I don't think, I'm sure there are some people who worry about whether, what's the Defender going to be like? Does it meet the current Defender? But, you know, at the end of the day, they're leaving money on the table and it's like, we're, we're going to put something out. You know, I suspect that this is going back to the Freelander. I suspect that at one point the Freelander was thought maybe to be some sort of a replacement because the Defender was considered kind of an entry level vehicle right. into into Land Rover. They didn't have an entry level vehicle in the U.S. for Land Rover that they wanted, and I thought you know the Freelander seemed to be that way, in, in an entry level vehicle, something cheaper that wasn't that right. much get you into the brand, and then then an because, affordable way to get into Land Rovers, and then get you into you know, and then you can buy get, a disco, get you addicted, and then you start buying real ones, and then you start buying yeah, then you buy your you know eighty thousand uh, dollar Range Rover, so. right. 
All right. Well, this is the time of the podcast. I'm going to crack a beer, and we're going to raise our raise our glasses. Everybody, get your, uh, your your crack a beer using your your 110 beer opener. Here we go from from Rovers North. I bought that. Why didn't you tell me this? Uh, um, it's standard. I would have had a beer in bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. John's the only one that has a beer anyway. <laughs> uh, would you like a beer? I, this, is the, this, is the, this was the um, kind of uh, apocryphal beer, you know, one for everybody. So. Raise your glass to the Defender. There we go. All right. I'll have a piece of and, and your, and your, and now that you said that, your bottle has proceeded to leak upon your counter. The king <laughs> is dead. Long live the king. And now, the M-Word. This month, for the M-Word, we will just observe a moment of silence for the end of the Defender. Welcome back to the 34th edition of the Center Steer Podcast. It is January 2016. Our guest this month is Craig Dutton. Craig is the photographer... Uh, you may know him uh, from My Land Rover Has a Soul. Uh, MyLandRoverHasASoul.com is the website. Welcome, Craig. Hey, how's it going? Oh, fantastic. Thanks for joining us on the show today and uh, providing your insight. So tell us about My Land Rover Has a Soul. It's a book. Is that right? Or it, it will be a book. book. It's, uh, it, it, it starts it off as a, a book, and it exploded into so much more than that, but... Um, let me tell you how, how it all started. I was sitting on the sides of the uh, Limpopo River in 2012-ish, 2011, taking photographs of, uh, of, of a cycling event. And this Land Rover 130 uh, Defender was crossing the river, uh, crossing the Limpopo, which is about a 100-meter wide river. And it was just such a beautiful image. And I took a photograph of this, and I thought, man, he has a... Yes, like I need to do a hundred of these, you know, and just tell these stories. And Land Rovers are just so photogenic. This was crossing the I, um, river in, in a no bridge required sort of way. Absolutely, there was a, there was zero bridge. It, it, it is it, it, funny enough. It's a border crossing, but uh, you need a four by four to to cross over from one country to the other because uh, okay, that's cool. No that's bridge. cool. Not, nothing wrong with that. That is cool. Is, was there yeah, water over, water over the cool. bonnet? Water over the bonnet. Oh yeah, oh. yeah. No, it's a proper weight. Uh, you 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 need to. You kind of need if you've never waited before. I have. Um, I doing have a hundred meter wide wade across a river that has crocodiles in it is quite something. And with one country on one side and another country on the other, exactly the only way to cross. I suspect there yeah. are men with guns on both sides. Nah, uh, and that's. Okay. So, but you know what? They probably were, but it's it's not that uh, it's yeah. not that crazy. You're right, right. right. Uh, the only the only reason why they have guns is because um, it is it is quite a a wildlife infested area, especially on the Botswana side. So you 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 could run into any form of wildlife: um, lion, elephant, something like that. <laughs> so you were taking photographs, and you thought you should ha- make a book. Exactly. Uh, like I say, uh, it was just such a photogenic moment, and uh, I. How long I ago was that? I, it was, uh, I think, twenty eleven or twenty twelve. Okay. So it's uh, so you're on year four of uh, or year five now, trying to get the book going, but something's happened in between, didn't it? Oof, man. Yeah, I. Uh, we call that decided, life getting well, in the way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I decided that. Um, before I go, I wanted to pub- self-publish the book. That was the first requirement. And before I did that, I thought I'd create a bit of awareness about the project. And I created a Facebook page called My Land Rover Has a Soul. And uh, from there on, I decided that we should get to have a little barbecue, you know, just a little weekend, a couple of Land Rovers, have a barbecue and everything would be a lot of fun. Um, and I thought, well, hey, hang on. If you're going to have a barbecue, let's – get an exhibitor or two and try and, you know, get the guys have something to look at. And if you're going to do that, well, then we may as well camp. And if you're going to do that, well, hey, let's have get something else to do. And I found this uh, Guinness World Record for the most Land Rovers in Convoy. And I thought, well, that would be fun to break. So I uh, organized a massive convoy of 1,007 vehicles, which uh, – 
completely obliterated the official record, which was 348 vehicles. But we didn't get the the, the record because we had um, two, our gaps were too big in the in the convoy, and that uh, Guinness World Record. Said that we needed a two and a half or three and a half vehicle gap between the vehicles, and sometimes there were five. I mean, you try and have <laughs> a thousand vehicles in a twenty-seven kilometer long convoy driving without concertina. It was it's like herding cats. It's impossible. You could chain them together. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> probably uh, had to to keep know, something I going. I had the, the post that weekend. I had every convoy expert in the country telling me how I should run a convoy of 1,000 vehicles. Of course. Um, oh, I'm sure. And there, there, is, no, there is no way. The, the only way to do it is everybody's got to be wide awake um, yeah. and drive decently. And we had, we had one accident on the uh, – one rear-ending accident on the route. Um, one series broke down. Uh, one series never made, out, made it out of the car park. Um, only only it? one. Yeah, that's that's a good percentage, really. Yeah, it's, like it's a thousand vehicles. Only one that's, never made it out. That's fantastic. But, but you hit on why this could never be done in our country. You said that everybody's got to be awake and everybody's got to be a good driver. You can't find <laughs> that many people no. in this country who know how to drive anything, let alone a yeah. Land Rover. Yeah. What's the requirement uh, for the for this? So it's it's a convoy. So you have to be all vehicles moving. Is there a minimum number of? Uh, is it like you know a mile or? Yeah, yeah. It was um, the the minimum distance that we we needed to travel was two point five kilometers. Um, so I don't know how much that is in miles. Probably about one point five miles. Yeah, about about or a so. mile and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it needed to the 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 each vehicle needed to pass uh, over that distance. We needed to capture uh, details for every single person, driver's license number, driver's uh, video footage, photographic footage. I had a helicopter in the air uh, getting video footage. Um, what else was there? Uh, and then, of course, yeah, just that damn following distance which let us down. Um, I actually went across to, to London to plead the case, uh, and there was, no, oh, yeah. sorry, no can do we can uh, give you dispensation for your next attempt, but we won't allow you to do it you know, in hindsight. Are you going to try so, it again? I did try it again. Um, I tried uh, – well, the following year, I did a, a big logo um, Remember that. On, the, on a field. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was great. We had 525 vehicles in the logo. So, effectively, we still beat the, the, the British record for the most vehicles parked in, in the area. Right. Um, we we didn't get the, the 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 required vehicles for the logo, so we didn't uh, break that record. Then um, I I tried it the next year again uh, to try and break the record, um, and the numbers have just dwindled um, since. You know, it was a, it was one of those one shot wonder things, and we've got to leave it for ten years and bring it back uh, just to try to do it every year, as the British have found it themselves. They you know, with yeah. their um, record, they just their numbers just keep on going down. Um, but having said that, the event itself, Landy Festival, uh, has grown from strength to strength. We've really had some good years. We've had four four solid years of growth. It's the biggest uh, Land Rover event of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere, and it's it's fantastic, man. It's such a great atmosphere. So, you, do you do you help organize Landy Festival? Or you I, part of I, this, or you are I Landy Festival. Organize it. Me and this chick, yeah. We <laughs> organize Landy Festival. <laughs> hey. <laughs> the one that's the she, one that's lying been, in been bed next to me. She's been <laughs> and, quiet uh, this whole time. Nine at night. Been quiet this whole time pretending not to be there. Yeah, she's just watching a TV program or something on her iPod. Trying not to let us disturb her, I guess. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so my wife and I organized the, the event um, in its entirety. Uh, it's been a bit of a baptism of fire, but my photographic experience um, is with events. I, I shoot events. So I've been around events for 14 years. Um, so it's not too foreign in terms of you know seeing how they are run and being involved in the running of them to actually organizing my own event. Um, but it is a lot of work and it's a lot of stress. Uh, you know, there's a lot of financial stress that goes into that, and and um, sponsorship hasn't been easy to come by. But we have an enormous 
support from the South African or Southern African Land Rover owners. And so it's been, it's great. It's been exactly what they needed and what they wanted. And it's been a great path, which kind of slowed down my, my, the work on my book a bit, but in hindsight, it wasn't a bad thing to slow down the work on the book because I've changed the, the model of how I wanted to do the book. Initially, the book was all about just great pictures of Land Rovers. And, um, since my visit to Billing last year and my subsequent discussion with uh, Patrick Krawachen from Land Rover Monthly magazine, I've now decided that it, it needs to be more than just a book of, of Land Rover photographs, but it's got to tell the stories um, that that kind of associate or bring together Land Rovers and the owners. And every Land Rover has a, or Land Rover owner has a great story to tell. Absolutely. I think that's a great that's, idea. So the, it's been so awesome just listening and having those interviews with these people has been phenomenal. That's really what makes Land Rover what it is. Yeah. So the Landy, yeah, absolutely. Landy Festival takes place in South Africa. Is it always in the yeah. same place? And and when is 16 going to occur? So we've had Landy Festival uh, at two different venues uh, in over the four years that we've been running it. Uh, the, the current venue is a place called Soot Doering Vacancy Plaats, which is Afrikaans. Um, and that is um, Sweet Thorn Vacation Farm, basically. <laughs> um, nice. It's been we, – we, we also moved the, uh, the, the timing of our event. It, was, it used to be the first half of the year. Now we moved to the second half of the year just to give uh, – everyone a bit of financial relief from the festive season. Uh, that seemed to work out quite nicely for us. So August is the is the period that we run Landy Festival, and we haven't set a date for it this year, but it's August, early September, around about there. Which is winter in the Southern Hemisphere. How? Uh, but I, yeah. assume, I assume it's not that cold, though. No, it isn't. Um, certainly not. Look, it can drop down to, to one between one and minus one, minus two um, in that area. But, yeah, um, but that's Celsius. That that, that's, is, that's, that's, that's still freezing. Yeah. Yeah, it is, but it's like bees to a honeypot for Land Rover owners because then they just pull out their fires and that's sit right. around drinking <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and telling stories around fires. You know, it's Same thing here. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's really um, it's fantastic. And that's, you know, I, I, I take a walk around the campsite, which has a 1,000 people in the campsite, and there are just – these clusters of people having drinks, telling stories around fires. And it is, it really is, it's a goosebump moment every single year. It's, it's phenomenal. That's every um, land until they start event. getting a little bit hammered around about two o'clock in the morning, then it's not that phenomenal. Then it's just. <laughs> could, could you imagine a thousand truck event on this continent? No. It, it, I mean, we've been to some big ones, but, you know, we're talking 200 trucks. Two, three at the most. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, you wouldn't. I can't say that I'd want to be at a thousand trucks. That would be. It depends on where. Here. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know that I'd want a thousand American idiots all lined up in the same place. Not, we're not all idiots. No, but. But if you have a thousand of us together. There's going to be a couple of idiots. Yeah, the chances are good you're going to encounter more than you want to. I have to uh, defend the podcast a bit. We have seen and talked about your events in the past. Uh, mm-hmm. we, I remember we talked about the uh, the convoy. So uh, I do remember the convoy, yeah. and we talked about the logo and everything. So uh, you know, we yeah. we just didn't talk to you, um, and I'm glad we're finally getting oh, to talk oh, to you. Our, so. our buddy, uh, our friends of the podcast, Graham and Louisa, have been to yeah. your event. Yeah, I met them. Uh, they they came to our first event. They they had a, a GoPro that they were raffling off to to raise money for their for their A to A trip. Right. Um, fantastic people. And uh, yeah, we've we've kept in touch. Uh, Graham sent me a book uh, which I received at my last Landy Festival. It was just some guy walked up to me and said, "Are you Craig Dutton?" And I said, "Yeah." He says, "I've got a present from you from Graham in, <laughs> in America." And uh, <laughs> Gave me the book, which is actually sitting next to my bed here. And, uh, it's a good book. N- nice man, to see just, that the Land yeah, Rover Underground Railroad is worldwide. Uh, absolutely. Have, absolutely. You, have you heard it, about it the Underground Railroad? No, I haven't, but I can I can appreciate it. It works perfectly. Uh, it, uh, it's, it, 
it's a thing we talk here in America, but if you know you you get apart from somebody and they'll, you know uh, people different people go to different events and so that will get handed off and handed off and in fact I got some sand ladders uh, from a gentleman over on the other side of the Pennsylvania and they picked them up for me in an event and I got them and we call that the Underground Railroad so you know basically free shipping works perfectly um, I, I, I can I can appreciate that but just to, uh, you know one one thing I wanted to to ask you guys was. You know, you're saying you're not sure if you'd want a thousand, uh, a thousand people, uh, a thousand American Land Rover owners at an event. And my question to you is: In South Africa, we have we have distinctly different people that drive different brands, types of owners. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we now, have that here. Uh, the 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 Land Rover crowd is is absolutely uh, fantastic. I mean, I say. Two or three o'clock in the morning. I've had it. Uh, I think I've had it at every event where I've had problems with someone doing something stupid. But it's, it's the exception and not the norm. Um, yet, uh, not to name drop any other brand, but other brands have contacted me asking me to do an event because it's been a successful um, model. But there's no way I could do it because that type of person that that brand attracts, I would be awake the whole night putting out fires. Is that the same sort of Thing with you guys? Uh, I don't know. It could be, but <laughs> if we were talking about Jeeps, absolutely, it'd be a train wreck. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's just basically pure numbers. I think because you get if you get a mark, it doesn't matter which one it is, and there's a lot of people in it. You're you then you your chances, I think, of having some knuckleheads increases. Mm. I, I think, think that's getting it. enough wide open space for that many people would be difficult. Yeah. Too. A lot of the places we have events here are much more. Well, here in the location. eastern half of the country. Yeah, definitely. Well, and, and that goes to my point yeah, about think, the number of Land Rover owners here is extremely limited. And yeah. so we're a little more friendly. We know each other. And because if you piss somebody off, someone's going to know about it. Even, uh, you know, that's. Yeah, everybody knows. Everybody's somebody. everybody. It's, yeah. Yeah, and if they don't, they will. Uh, well, and part of the problem with Land Rover here in the States is that, uh, let's face it, those of us that actually get out and use our vehicles the way they are meant to are in an extreme minority. Oh, we're in a minority of a minority. Yeah, yeah. clearly, absolutely, so. yes. So uh, to your point, uh, I mean, I think if you got a, you know you got a thousand Jeep owners together here in the U.S., your I think your chances of uh, you probably know, having a hundred idiots. If yeah, you know, some knuckleheads yeah. is going to be there. But if you got a thousand Land Rover people together, you're still going to have probably the same number of knuckleheads. Right. That's just my opinion. I, I, others yeah. may disagree, but of course, if you go to Europe, I think the same thing might happen. You know, you, you get you're going to get a bunch of Land Rover people together because it's easier. There's a bunch of them, and you're going to have X number of knuckleheads too. Uh, I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah, I, I found that um, you know, from the South African Landy Festival perspective, it really it, it definitely attracted a, a a more calmer bunch of people. They just enjoyed. They just absorb that whole thing, walking around, looking at everyone's vehicles. Um, it's been a it's been a great uh, reunion type of thing, and you know, people meeting each other one year and coming back next year. Um, but I, and and if I could give one word of advice to anybody who would like to to organize an event, um, and I've stuck to my guns on this, is don't organize your event to try and um, don't don't. Don't find a good venue in the middle of nowhere because people aren't going to come. You need to find a good venue close to a big center. People, the number of people that that you have in your catchment is what's more important. And um, yeah, and I think that would be a problem my... here too, definitely, because America is such a big, big country, and it to get out. yeah, and, and there, are, there are really aren't that many Land Rovers as a percentage of the population. So yeah. getting enough people to show up over the distance is the limiting factor in the size of our events. And that plays out here because you, yeah, you look at Virginia, you get big, there's a big percentage of Land Rover folks in Virginia and you get a good turnout for their events. But then the main winter romp, for example, which is next weekend, you know, you're not going to get, you're going to get a handful of people. Well, we'll get, but last gonna... time I was there, it was 104 trucks. Okay, I, I'm wrong because that's really good for middle yeah, nowhere for Maine. What, for what that is, that's mm-hmm. a, an extremely good. When I'm out. driving like 800 miles, for how long it way. takes to get there? Yeah, well, it takes a special yeah. kind of diehard to do that. All right, well, all right, all right uh, Craig, we might be wrong. <laughs> First for the podcast, <laughs> well, we may be wrong. Well, but I mean, there won't be many people that come as far as I do. Yeah, but a hundred trucks, a hundred trucks for for uh, for Maine is, I think, a lot. 
Well, you, you know get two hundred for a for a uh, Virginia I, event. I think when you look at the number of Land Rovers in the northeastern United States, and I'm talking Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, Maine, and Quebec. Yeah, and they get people out of Co- out of Quebec. Mm-hmm. So, I know, think that's really good. When, when yeah, when you when you look at that number, I, I don't think it is surprising. It's not as surprising as some of the stuff you see in Virginia. Honestly, I, absolutely. As, as I said, I think we're now wrong. And so. there really are no other events in February. Right. That's true. That is true. You should you should fly over. Change your plans, Craig. You should be going to the Winter Romp in Maine. When is it? Uh, next weekend. February. No, it's the uh, oh no, it's, it's the 12th through the 14th. It's tw- yeah, it will it will happen, but it won't happen this year. I'm trying to move my family to Scotland next week, and that's in, in uh, itself is a big move. Indeed, yeah. get, get a stopover in Maine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's near yeah. it's near New Scotland, Nova Scotia. That's New Scotland. <laughs> well, when we uh, there you go, we goofed on our tickets. That's it. Yes. <laughs> the, the, the whole the whole thing with the winter romp, of course, is people then look at you and go, "You went where in February? Yeah, why yeah. would you do that?" Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to go. I just if I had the time. That's that the same amazing. looks I got in Minnesota when I went camping the end of January. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Landy Festival will take place in August of this year, and Landy Festival has spurred the uh, well came out of your book. And so mm. tell us more about the book because you know you you have a you have a website for it. You also are on Facebook. Yep. And what's the book going to be about? When's it coming out? How much? It's another question. How right, much? a lot of lot of questions that I have to think of. Fast. We got to push uh, push product here. We, you know, we were helping uh, we were helping the bells. We can help you. Fantastic. So the book is about uh, it, it, well, the book is called My Land Rover Has a Soul. Um, the, uh, let me just tell you that the name came from um, the ex-managing, no, ex-marketing director of Land Rover South Africa, an absolute Land Rover fan. And I was sitting talking to him about the book concept over lunch one day, and uh, and he we were just talking about you know just why why it would be such a great book. And he said, Craig, because Land Rovers have a soul. Like boom, there it is. Thank oh, you very much. It's a great name. I, it is. I agree. That is really it's good. Fantastic and. So um, the book now is really about great pictures of Land Rovers um, and the stories that are attached to the Land Rover owners um, and those Land Rovers. And it, it is an absolute joy meeting every single Land Rover owner that I meet. And, and I go through the same set of questions. I record the, the interview and you know, I ask questions about when, you're, when did you get your first Land Rover, how long have you had your Land Rover, some people, this is their their first Land Rover, and they've only had it for two years, but they're absolutely hooked. You know, other people have been driving Land Rovers for forty years. Um, it only takes one to get addicted. Absolutely, <laughs> and the stories that come out of it are just phenomenal. And I've got to share at least two with you, please. So, I uh, I oh, interviewed this. Open up a new beer youngster. if you're drinking along. It's time for a new beer. Yeah, it is. Um, I interviewed this this young chap in in Inverness. Uh, took a photograph of his lovely old Series Two, which uh, is on my site uh, on the, on my Land Rover Has a Soul on the homepage. Uh, you'll see a, a, a picture of us, this youngster in the green Series Two, lots of trees and forest around. Um, series Three, sorry. Anyway, and uh, I said to him, "No, oh, you you must have a memorable story about your Land Rover." That's it. Uh, you must have a, a, a memorable story about your Land Rover. Tell me, tell me what you got. He says, "Well, one day I was. It was winter in Inverness. It is just freezing. Um, I'd been to uh, KFC to buy dinner, and I I was on my way home, and my clutch packed up. Uh, he said he stops on the side of the road, opened his bonnet." No one wanted to stop in and assist, and he was pretty much stranded in, in Inverness in winter with his uh, clutch uh, slave cylinder gone. He, uh, he, he'd uh, pushed out liquid, something like that. I don't really know what the problem was. You see, and then I, I remember that I had a bottle of Ribena. I don't know if you guys know what Ribena is. There, I do know what Ribena is. Grape juice or It's black juice, currant. It black currant juice. Black currant juice, that's it. I have and a bottle upstairs. Poured, he poured his Rabina 
into his clutch slave cylinder or his <laughs> and literally got home on Rabina. <laughs> that is a great story, actually. Right. Yeah. It's just fantastic. I just love it. And, uh, you know, qu- it's these is, sort of stories. Did it stay fixed after that? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But, uh, and, and he's a he's a young guy. He's about 28 or something like that. And Genius. You know, yeah, great. Uh, and this is what makes Land Rover so amazing. This is Meccano set type of mentality that you can literally fix it with anything, mm-hmm. um, you know, a piece of wire and a bottle of grape juice, and you're good to go. There's an infamous picture where a double A guy fixed one with a potato. Oh, okay. I've seen that, yeah. And we well, actually we have some we'd have some stories for you for of a of a I know of a D two being fixed on the trail that went too fast and water got into the uh, computer and because the computer had a uh, it was a, a D one but yeah D one sorry th- sorry D one and there was a little hole in it and the, all the mud got in there and. Uh, what did Mark you Mark uh, a toothbrush and a can of WD forty? Yes, it was my toothbrush and a and a can of WD forty, and got it back yeah. on the road, and it got off the trail. Yeah. Oh, do you still yeah. use that toothbrush? I do not. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's those type of stories that that um, that go into the book, and and to be honest, I'm not um, I'm not selecting images or or anything that goes into the book based on how great the story is because. Every story that I have interviewed has been great, no, no matter how big or small. Um, you know, sometimes the smallest things like, uh, I, you know, I took my, my daughter to to her wedding in my Series 3 is is a great story. Yeah. And and those are the things that, that we all appreciate as Land Rover owners, every single little moment that we drive. Even when you're driving to the shop in your Land Rover is is a great moment. Um, is and and those are the things that I think make this book so great. Like when I take my 109 to lunch. Exactly. Yep. I mean, I just drive two miles down the road and all the people that are looking and staring at me because, you know, of course, I'm driving on the right-hand side <laughs> of the vehicle. Yeah. So what was your second yeah, I, second story? You had a second one? Well, I met this guy in Sweden. His name was Knut. K-N-U-T. Oh, uh, we'd say Knut probably here. But, Knut. Yeah. Prob- it, and know. it is probably Knut. Um, but I'm South African, so I mess everything up. And uh, he uh, also another winter story. Uh, uh, ironically, most of these uh, Land Rover stories seem to happen in winter. Um, it had been snowing like crazy where he lived. Uh, everything was snowed in. He had a, a taxi driver knock on his door and say, "Sir, you need to help me in a hurry. I have a pregnant woman who's gone into labour." And I can't get it to the hospital. The hospital is 20 miles away. He he said that he had uh, remembered that a freight train had just gone past. So he knew the train line was open. And he contacted the uh, train master, station master at this town 20 miles away. told him to hold the trains. He's coming down the train track in his uh, Defender. <laughs> and uh, literally got his got the woman into the into the hospital. By going down the train track, and that's defender. a great. That is a great story. Nice. That's yeah. That's outstanding. That's outstanding. And, and this is this is the essence of the book. It's just a hundred hundred odd images and stories, uh, uh, short stories. You know, three hundred word um, stories, and and it's, it's not only about the story. It's in a, what Land Rover you drive, when did you get it, how did you get it, why did you get it, has it got a name, uh, why has it got a name, and all these little. Beautiful things that make Land Rover ownership so awesome. So, how many, you said there's going to be a hundred of these, and I assume you're already planning a second book or a third book. Well, yeah, um, I think <laughs> I think the way things are going is it's going to have to go down the road of of volumes, if you want to call it that. Uh, there's just too many Land Rovers and too many stories around the world to. Uh, yeah, I don't know miss. how I don't know how you could cut it down to just a hundred. That's true. Yeah. Money. <laughs> yeah. and you, this book is going to cost me yeah, roughly fourteen thousand dollars a a shot to to print, and uh, I need to keep it to roughly two hundred pages. Otherwise, it's going to be too expensive. Right, uh, but I don't, I don't think you could cut it down to one hundred. I think you really kind of have to start doing volumes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Which, and, and if it goes well, is only more revenue for you. And that's that's the way I would love it to go. Um, you know, uh, this. 
this chapter of my photographic career, um, it, it fills two two beautiful voids. One is it, it it helps me with my career as a photographer, which has been going for 14 years, and the other is my um, love for Land Rover. Um, you know, I'm absolutely hooked, hook, line, and sinker, yeah, uh, and it's just so awesome for it to become a part of my career. So you take the pictures, you interview the individuals, I assume you visit them in person, so you're flying around yep. the world? Yeah, well, I, I'm quite fortunate to have, um, with my with my photographic work, I travel around the world for uh, various other companies shooting events, which helps me to get around the world to, to shoot these images. Um, I'll be off to uh, Argentina in March. I will be in uh, the Netherlands in April, in Colombia in May, Brazil in June, July, August, America in September-ish, and somewhere in between that, I've got to get down to South Africa. I've got to get into Europe, which is where I'm living now, um, and, of course, down to the UAE, which has got some amazing, amazing vehicles mm -hmm. and scenery. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of travel ahead of me and a lot of photography to do. Well, well let us know when you hit the States because we'll be glad to talk to you. We'll hook you up. Oh, yeah. I, I, I have a, a two-week stay in the States. Um, I have two, two events that are, are three weeks apart with you know, two weeks in between, um, three weekends apart. So um, when, when is my that? trip, in, it's in September. I don't know the exact date. Uh, do you know what part of the country? Yeah, um, primarily going into South Carolina and ending up in Florida. Um, so it may involve either a, a road trip from South Carolina to Houston. Uh, we have family living in Houston, mm. and I know there's a lot of Land Rovers in Houston, um, and then a road trip back to Florida. Um, or, or it may end up being a, a jump in a plane and flying somewhere else. I've, I've been in touch with the, um, the Land Rover owners, uh, Facebook, one of them, one of those guys, and, and there's some really nice – Land Rovers up New York State side, and whilst this can't form part of this trip, oh, I feel Ed. very compelled to do a special trip just for that because I think there's some amazing vehicles there. There's some amazing vehicles all over the country, actually. We could. That's uh, that's so true, and that's the problem. Yeah, indeed, because it's you know, a good you, problem to have. It is. You can come to Pennsylvania. You can go up to Vermont. Uh, there's some in Maine, uh, Virginia. Certainly, there's a there's a big outcropping of uh, Land Rovers in the Virginia area around DC. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a off-road park in New, uh, excuse me, North Carolina called Uhari. Uh, I've actually been there in my Freelander. Uh, so there, I think there's a North Carolina has a good contingent. Of course, Texas has Scar, which is their Land Rover Club. Yeah, the South Central area. South Central something. Yeah, and I think there's one developing yeah. in Alabama. Oh, oh, you you've probably heard about the there's a bar in Alabama that is the half of a, a, a series two. Yeah, I actually have heard of that. And uh, Birmingham, and then not Birmingham. too long ago, probably about two weeks, I I, uh, I spotted that on Facebook, and uh, yep. definitely has got to be part of the uh, part of the reason to to do a trip there. As long as there are some Land Rover owners there that uh, we oh, can are. meet and oh, they have a beer and. They do come out. They they they're 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 everywhere. They you'd be surprised. I mean, it's, we, there's not a lot of yeah. us, but we're there. We're, we, we'll we'll come out. Especially if you, especially to show off our trucks, of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he needs to swing up to North Carolina and see Will. Oh, that's true. I think Will would would get a page in the book. That's true. Will is uh, we call him the Defender of Defenders. He helped to get some defenders back from the United States government when they were seized. And, oh, right. And which is a rare event. And when we say some, uh, I think that was pretty well all. Uh, well, yeah, but and they gave him a defender. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's the best part of the story is his clients got together and and gave him bought him a defender, and he just came back from Sully Hall. Yes, he oh, was wow. he was at the uh, over there for the final production. He just yeah, he just friended me on Facebook. Yeah. So. I um, on my last trip to to South Carolina um, last year, I, I tried to get some some photography done, and I just I couldn't get it right, but. Um, I did meet some people uh, just via Facebook, and there's a guy 
who does some some uh, builds and sells defenders uh, or you know Land Rovers, um, South Carolina. I don't exactly know, remember where uh, what the guy's name was, but it's probably, uh, you know probably there's a Himalaya. good few people. Sorry, it's probably Himalaya. He's in Hilton Head. <laughs> oh, Himalaya four by four. Yeah, yeah I, I, something like that. Um, I don't remember. I was just uh, while we were talking, I was just trying to trying to find it in Evernote, but I can't find it. But um, anyway, yeah, there, there are a good few people out there, and it definitely, I don't think I'm going to have a problem finding people. It's more a case of finding the time to get things done because there's a fair chance that I need to spend three months working at the Olympics uh, in Brazil, which is going to dig deep into the amount of time I can shoot. Yep. Well, so it could book. be volume two could just be the United States itself. You know. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Because you've got to get to the West Coast, and you've got to get up to uh, Defenders Northwest. They, they, he, he takes some good photography himself. Um, yeah. And there's a, there's a big uh, big outcropping of Land Rovers in California. Uh, oh, and you'd have to take – you have to get to the what we call the – Sully Hall Society has the National Rally here in the United States, and that's always a good get. Uh, tons of rovers show up for that. On the, that's in the West Coast, and they, especially when they go to Moab. If you've never been to Eastern U- Utah, oh yeah, it is just it's uh, it is literally otherworldly, and it's a, it's a great place to take photographs. Uh, can, that would be yeah. So yeah, there's volume two for you right there. It could just be uh, just could just be North America. Love that. I think I need to come and spend a few months in America. Sure, you can free space here in uh, Pennsylvania. Walk you up. Fantastic. Looking uh, forward to it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. uh, we're the hopefully the bells. I gotta. I gotta. Uh, he'll he'll listen to the show eventually, so I'll have to do a shout out to uh, to Graham, and then we should make fun of him. But eventually, yeah. he'll come here, so to the house. Uh, yeah, so- they're actually planning on on um, coming over to Europe, so I'm hoping to put him into the book as well. Uh, I really wish. I hope we we, we cross paths because he's an he would be an important uh, addition mm-hmm. addition to the book. Actually, you stand a likely chance of running into him in Brazil. <laughs> he seems he to just love can't that seem place. To South America, he's in love with that place. Well, yes. every time he goes one direction, he ends up in Brazil. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. It's like a magnet for him. So, when is the book going yeah. to be available? I'm hoping for a release in in December of this uh, year for, for for Christmas orders. Okay, um, that's the plan, and and a lot rests on whether or not Brazil happens. Uh, there's a part of me that um, is looking forward to going to work at the Olympics for three months, but there's a part of me that hopes it doesn't happen because I've got a book to produce, and <laughs> this book is more important than the Olympics to me, to be honest. And how much do you anticipate the price to be for the book? I'm looking at a, a price point of between 40 and $50. Now, okay. this is a, a coffee table format? Yeah, it's a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter book. It's a 10 inch book, uh, 11 inches, uh, 11 inch squared. Um, which, when when opened up, uh, you know, it's obviously 22 yeah. inches by 11 inches. Right. And uh, beautiful paper, beautiful photos. Right, it, and I assume it's the format that we see on your webpage with a nice big photograph and pretty much. Yeah, that'll look really nice. That'll and a bit nice. of text on on the side. Yeah. Yeah. I want a signed copy. I'm already I'm already requesting my signed copy. That's fantastic. I'll, I'll probably be launching a a, a crowd uh, a crowdfunding campaign within an, within two to three months to uh, to try and kickstart this because it's going to be a fair amount of money invested. And uh, I am fortunate enough that I don't use any I don't need to use any of this crowdsourced funding for the travel because it's part of my work as it is. But it's going to be an expensive process to uh, to print the book, and that's what we're going to aim for. Yeah, that that high gloss printing isn't cheap. No. Well, yep. if you let us know, we'll be sure to plug it, and, and push I'm it. sure those of us at the podcast would probably be uh, contributing to it. Uh, I think we would. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm really really hoping to be able to get out to you guys. You know, um, it's it's. It's one thing just knowing there's a lot of Land Rovers out there, but when you know that there's Land Rovers and passionate Land Rover owners and you've actually spoken to them, you kind of are almost obligated to make the effort and get out there and right. take photos. Well, and I think the people that listen to our podcast, you know, our numbers aren't super high, but, you know, a couple hundred people, and they are around the world, yeah. and they have, yeah. by definition, they're passionate. Because they're listening to yeah. the show and they listen to us blather on every month, so yeah. uh, you know. And, and or, or as I refer to it, a hardcore addict. 
Hardcore yeah. Hacks, very nice. I, I got an email from uh, the president of, of Rove uh, because we had some dates wrong. On, Who is the president? I, I'd have to look it up, Dave. I'm sorry. I forgot. Uh, but I, I, I got some dates wrong on Mar, but he was listening to an old show. <laughs> So we're going to have them on the show soon, and they Good. can talk about Mar for 2016. But this, they were he was listening to an old show from uh, we were talking about Mar for 14, and um, so uh, I'm hoping they'll have them on the show. And so my reason I bring that up is you don't know who's listening, and they're out there, and they're and they're most likely mm. hardcore addicts, uh, you know, Land Rover people. So you know this might be your this is your target audience, I think. Yeah, I, I think if there's one thing I could, um, or two things I could say, is one is we, we've got a, um, a link on our website uh, for a, um, a a little newsletter, which, you know, if you want some information on it, just uh, plug in your, your name into the newsletter, your name and email address into the newsletter form, and, and we'll keep you posted. Um, and the other thing is you know, get hold of me. I, I I'm really keen to 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 meet and chat as many Land Rover people as possible. And if there are people out there that have a, a special vehicle, um, and if it's possible that I can get to them, I certainly will. Uh, it's special vehicles that that definitely attract. Um, I, this last week, I shot a 1977 Series Three uh, fire wagon Ooh. with, with 20, 26 or twenty three thousand miles on the clock. Whoa. Um, Absolute mint condition, beautiful vehicle, and um, it's just on Facebook. It's just exploded. It, people are just loving it to bits, and you know, it shows me those those special vehicles are out there, and people want to see them. You need to hook up with uh, Graham Aldous. Do you know who that is? Uh, no, he uh, has a company does videos, and he did. Uh, he was invited by a Land Rover to do the official Land Rover 65 video. And he's, right. he's in the UK. Uh, Tia Fit is his uh, company name. I, I'll send you the info. Uh, but he has – he got to video and see when they the, when Land Rover for the 65 brought all those special vehicles in and had them on display. And yeah. he did a video of all that. Uh, he'd be a good person to maybe put you on to some of those special vehicles if that, if that you know, is, interests you. So he's a, he's a good resource for that. Yeah. We actually drove past a, a, a Defender snowplow today. Um, nice. We didn't get to. I, I actually need to go back and and go knock on the guy's door right. and find out who he is and why he has a snowplow in his front yard. <laughs> but it's this great big bright yellow Defender with a snowplow in front of it. It's quite crazy. Sure, sure. Cool. Lots of them out there, and they're all beautiful. I like that. They are all beautiful. Are they not? Are they not? So my Land Rover has a soul. My Land Rover has a soul dot com, and you're also my Land Rover has a soul on Facebook. Book is coming yep. out towards the end of the year. You're going to have a crowdfunding uh, site soon. We'll help. Yep. To, happy to push that for you. Uh, so the way to keep in contact with you, I assume, is through your is through the website and the newsletter. Yeah, definitely. There's uh, contact details on the website. I am sure of that. And if there's not, I will put it up in the next day or so. I'll check my site now. Uh, but yeah, contact me through the website. Contact me through through Facebook, and um, you know I will always respond to everyone. But I may not be able to take a photograph of everyone's Land Rover, and I, I just uh, you know, unfortunately, I won't. I'll never be able to do it. And people should just not take it personally. <laughs> so, what do you drive, and how did you get into Land Rovers? Uh, I drive a P thirty eight Range Rover P thirty eight. I I, my first uh, Land Rover was a Discovery One Three Hundred TDI uh, in South Africa. Good Loved choice. Loved that thing to bits. Uh, We're all salivating. Hated the hated it as much as anyone hates Land Rovers, but <laughs> loved it at the same token. Welcome to Gave your me so much grief with uh, with overheating. It was the amount of, of trouble I've put my family through, through with that thing was just ridiculous. <laughs> this is the definition of the addiction. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'll share one story on that. I was driving from Johannesburg to, to, uh, to Durban on a very, very, very hot summer's day. And one of the telltale signs on a, a 300 TDI, if you're losing water or if you've got a problem with your heating, uh, with your circulation, it's going to run your vent on hot. And if it gets cold, 
you got no water in the top of your engine and you got a problem coming. I ran my vents in my whole car on steaming hot oh. on a 35 degree Celsius day oh. for four, five, six hours. I wasn't popular, but my vehicle was fine, so that's all that counts. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, we refer to that as the extra radiator. Yes. <laughs> I've been known to use that a lot. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic, and that's the that's the first piece of advice I give anyone when the, that I know that owns a 300 TDI. Um, so I've I've had that I've had the uh, the Discovery three or the LR three, uh, the V eight. It was the, probably the nicest vehicle I've ever owned. It's it's just phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, we used it like it was intended to be used, um, and then through uh, Land Rover, I had uh, I was sponsored to defend a, a Pumas. Um, both a 2.2, and they were lovely. I really enjoyed wow. them. Yeah, um, more, yeah. more, no, more jealousy over here. <laughs> more jealousy. But I don't have that relationship with them anymore. Um, you know, now that I live uh, in the other side of the world, and I'm driving my P38 and loving it. But I, I think my next purchase will probably be a Discovery too. I feel, I feel slightly uneasy about long trips in my P38 and I know you the should. Discovery is better than the than the Rangy so I'm going to uh, go over to the to the Disco I PDC. love my D2s. Disco's a new yeah. series. Yeah. They're so they're so non electronic. This 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 P38 Discovery hasn't given me a a, a a single bit of trouble other than well, uh, Don't blood jinx blood. it by saying that. Sell it sell it before <laughs> it does. Um it really hasn't. It's been fantastic. Other uh, than it wouldn't start uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, it was glow plugs. Um, it's been great, but I still don't trust it. Uh, I feel like I, I need to go back to a vehicle that I know. And then for the Landy Festival, folks can I have a link to the website. And that's coming up, and you're going to be helping to organize that again for 2016. Is that and... absolutely? Yeah, yeah, we'll be. We'll be um, getting ha- having guys in South Africa helping us organize it, and we'll be doing a lot of the work remotely and then fly into South Africa to kind of put the polishing touches on it. Nice. The Landy Festival is all about Sheree and, and myself, my wife and I. You know, we've become the personalities around the event. We know so many people. Um, it's not an event organized by a a big fat corporate company. It's an event organized by husband and wife and, yep. and that's the way it will always stay. That's cool. Now, now the festival has its own website. Yes. Yeah. Landyfestival.co.za. Okay. okay. Or ZA if you're not in the United States. Yeah. ZA. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's all right. No worries. We're, we're bilingual here. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Craig, for uh, joining us on the show today. And I look forward to seeing the book and I want number one. Can I get copy number one? You got it. You asked for it. You got it. Sweet. No one else has asked for it. See? Okay, good. I want copy number one. So you can pull pull any book out of the stack and write a number one in the corner, and there you go. Don't. Shh, quiet. Quiet. <laughs> <laughs> quiet, you. Quiet, you. Hopefully, Craig, you can stay with us on the show as we move into our uh, heritage segment, or do you need to go? No ways. I want to listen to the heritage segment. Right. Well, then you'll then hang about, and we'll be right back with the heritage segment. On episode 109 of the 4x4 podcast, we talk all about a bunch of new stuff going on. Everything from new tires, uh, throttle bodies, shooting caribou, northern lights, removing salt. Oh, man, tons of stuff. Also, in the news segment, we talk about uh, the F-150 getting a diesel motor, Sheldon Creed racing in the Dakar Rally, the Chevy Colorado getting some strong aftermarket support. For aptitude, our wares, uh, our off-road aptitude, we talk about where to wheel, it's how you can link up with different off-roaders and find out what's going on in your area. Off-roading 101, we talk about tow points, what they are and what they are not. For our outdoor edible segment, we talk about cooking fuel, what you need to know before you get out there. We do a gear review on the Princeton Tech headlamp that uh, I've been using enough, and uh, we wish you all a happy new year. So. When you're done listening to this episode of uh, the podcast, head over to the 4x4podcast.com slash 109 and listen to the 4x4 podcast.
Welcome back to number 34 of the Center Steer Podcast. And uh, joining us now, as always, our, and for our heritage segment, will be the owner and operator of SeriesParts.com. I think we should push your site, too, also, Morgan, uh, is well, Morgan you. from the Green Mountain State. And this month, you're going to talk chassis. Is that right? Uh, yeah, basically chassis and body. We've gone over pretty much everything else in the Series Land Rovers. Um, so pretty much uh, only thing left. Um, but also, you know, the core of the the series Land Rover, really. It's a fairly uh, classic design that started in 1948. Um, so it's a body-on-frame design, which makes it pretty robust. Um, As all trucks should be. Uh, agreed. Yep. Um, we'll get to a little more of that. <laughs> um, it's a you know, fairly heavy chassis uh, with, it's not exactly aluminum, but we'll get to that as well, uh, body. So it's a fairly light body on top of a heavy, heavy chassis, which especially at the time in the, you know, late 40s, early 50s, made it to a fairly stable platform. So the the chassis itself is uh, a boxed ladder frame. Basically, uh, it's made out of, uh, it's got long rails running end to end with some, some cross members running across the center, hence the ladder design uh, box frame. So it's, you know, made from flat steel stock uh, welded together. You know, a lot of other vehicles tend to use uh, like C-channel and stuff like that, which is, you know, uh, a piece of flat stock that has been bent into sort of a C-shape and runs the entire length of the, the frame. Now, these are obviously a little lighter and have some other benefits that they don't, you know, hold liquid and, and stuff like that. But they also tend to uh, have other downsides so the the box ladder frame is is probably one of the the strongest and simplest to manufacture and, and that's why they you chose the box frame design originally was actually they didn't need a special tooling there's another reason for that too by going to the box they could use thinner steel so they could use less material and steel was hard to get back then exactly so less tooling less actual steel used uh, it works out pretty well. And, you know, in addition to being easy to manufacture and being strong, uh, it doesn't twist. Um, that's one of the things you see in C-Channel is that it still can twist pretty easily. Uh, you'll see that in a lot of more modern vehicles, especially pickup trucks. You'll notice that they they twist a lot between chassis and body, which, you know, can have its advantages, but it's not quite as strong and you know because you're using thinner steel and flat stock uh it's actually a pretty easy frame for the enthusiast or the beginner to to work on themselves uh in the field anywhere you don't really have to have you know anything special in terms of tools or training to to make a repair obviously the cons are you know relatively heavy uh, despite using uh, thinner metal. And it does have a propensity to trap water and dirt, which causes it to corrode a lot faster and less properly maintained. And given that it's made with thin gauge metal, it rusts through that much quicker. Uh, very quickly, <laughs> definitely. So those of you guys that are in the know, how much thinner is the series chassis than, say, a Discovery 2? Because I can tell you my, my Discovery 2, I hate to think what it weighs at this point because I stuck my finger in one of the holes in the side of the frame and realized that my chassis is completely filled with mud. <laughs> yeah, you might actually be better off drilling some drain holes and flushing it out. Yeah. But no, yeah. I've cut apart a, 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 a 90 chassis, relative modern Defender chassis, and the metal is not that much thicker than a series truck frame. So what you're telling me is my custom series truck frame that I have, I better hold on to because it's probably a... Uh... Well, that one was made with far more steel than any series truck frame ever was. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's roughly 14 gauge, so, you know, 75, 80 thousandths of an inch thick, give or take. Um, and the chassis they they made in various wheelbases over the years for the series Land Rovers. Um, the early ones were 80 inch. They moved to in terms of the short wheelbase 86, and eventually to 88. And ever since they stuck with uh, 88 for the short wheelbase and uh, 109 for the long wheelbase. Obviously, they had some variations here and there for for various models. For example, pickups and uh, Station wagons are slightly different here and there, 
But overall, that's that's what they've stuck to. In terms of the body, while the chassis is steel, the body, uh, only the bulkhead or firewall and the uh, radiator panel are the steel portions of the series Land Rover. Pretty much everything else is uh, Bermabrite, and Bermabrite is an aluminum and magnesium alloy. It was originally designed to ris- resist corrosion um, and was developed for use in boats and aircraft. So those are sort of the, the benefits, uh, the corrosion resistance. Now we'll get to that in a minute because there's uh, it actually has a propensity to corrode in the use, um, in that particular use case. And obviously being aluminum, it's very light. It's fairly easy to work with in many ways. But the big con there is that it is subject to galvanic corrosion. And I'll sort of go into that uh, in a little more detail shortly. Uh, but that can cause panels to get eaten away. And at this point, they're hard to replace. It's also difficult to paint. It has to be properly etched prior as any aluminum does. It's fairly soft and it does work harden. So the more you bend or hammer it, uh, it gets harder, resists bending and, and eventually becomes more brittle. Um, unless you know how to anneal it. Right, unless you anneal it. Interestingly, that was actually one of the original uh, sort of features of Bermabrite was that you could cold press it into shape and it would work hardened and hold that shape easily. So kind of interesting how that works. And of course, in these in the series Land Rovers, they had many different body styles. So, you know, traditional short wheelbase, uh, basically a three-door. If you had a top on it, you could obviously run them topless. You can fold down the windscreen. You can do soft tops, everything from a bimini top, a three-quarter top, or a full top in terms of the soft tops. They had pickup cabs and van sides. Van sides were basically the three-door in short or long wheelbase. You could get a station wagon, which was five-door in the, the long wheelbase. They had high-capacity pickups. They had, you know, some of the, the military spec, like the lightweight air portables, uh, ambulances, uh, forward controls, which were used military and civilian, uh, you know, business use. So it's, uh, as as we've mentioned before, uh, like a Mechanoa set, uh, set or uh, over here, we called them erector sets. Uh, very much whatever you wanted, it can be built on that one platform <laughs> or easily adapted. And if you get tired, you can change it. Right, exactly. Nothing prevents you from, you know, going topless in the summer and putting on a hard top for winter. It's pretty easy. And Relatively few bolts. And the thing is, if you carry uh, half a dozen spanners and a bucket of bolts with you, you can fix it anywhere. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, they they used pretty much flat panels for most of the design up until the, the Series 2. They decided to, you know, make it a little more modern by rounding off the top of the bodies. <laughs> um, so, you know. Most things can easily be cut from sheet metal and and replaced without much tooling. So you know it's a it's a it's definitely a platform that continued through the Defender in that way. But the one thing I wanted to sort of go a little more into detail is uh, the galvanic corrosion, because uh, that is really the thing that affects series Land Rovers most and at this point are are more difficult to keep on top of because uh, the manufacturer of Bermabrite shut down quite some time ago, so you can't actually get new Bermabrite. Uh, we're going to go into a chemistry lesson here. <laughs> uh, so that's an electrochemical process. Uh, basically, when you have two metals that are in contact um, and in in an electrolyte solution, one metal will corrode preferentially to the other. Assuming um, they're not the same metal. Right, they not the same metal, two dis- differing metals. Dissimilar metals, they call it. Right, exactly. Um, and an electrolyte is uh, a substance that when, you know, dissolved in water or some other, they call them polar solvents, um, will create an electrically uh, conducting solution. Good some example of, those... of which is salt water. Right, exactly. Uh, it's pretty much salts, acids, and bases that are soluble. Um, Road salt and, and salt melted water it snow. Is. Yeah, salt water is the big one here. That can be the ocean or, you know, in the our area in the northeast. We love to salt our roads. 
they've actually decided that to make it salting roes even less expensive, they use salt brine. So they're actually putting a salt solution on the roads making instead of it, just putting the salt on the road and letting it do its work. Making it more convenient for the process. It's, exactly. But that's also because then the salt stays on the road longer and you get to use less salt. It's not just because the, when they found that if they just dropped salt, it would spread to the, you know, it would run off the road and it would not be in the place where it needed to be. Oh, definitely. And it, you know, it actually coats your car pretty evenly with salt more than it used to. So, oh, of course, the spray is wonderful. A ready to use car dissolver. Exactly. It's quite helpful. And of course, you know, the extreme temperatures. What do you want? Clear roads or, or, or do you want your car to, to fall apart in 30 years? Which is it? Uh, well, the roads are much more fun when they're not clear. So, yeah, I, I don't want clear roads. Yeah, I, I prefer unsalted roads, but you know, it's America, and uh, I don't necessarily trust the other people on the road. So, I understand why they do it. But again, it is they're putting an electrolyte solution on everything, and uh, the electrolyte solution actually allows ions from the. There's an anodidic metal and a cathodic metal, uh, so an anode and a cathode. And so um, one becomes more what electrically is... positive and one is more electrically negative. Right, exactly. It's actually the electroplating process in reverse. Yes, definitely. And so what happens is it allows ions uh, to pass through the electrolytic solution from one to the other, and it makes the the anode, um, the one that is, uh, let's see. Um, the anode would be negative. The anode is the more negative, yes. Um, it has an N in it, N for negative. Right. <laughs> I always forget that rule. <laughs> and, and, and cathode has a T, T for like a plus sign. Right. Um, so it'll actually cause it to uh, corrode more quickly. Uh, and, you know, again, this is an electrolytical or, or yeah, a electrochemical process. So there does have to be electricity in the process. And so in, you know, a vehicle, generally you're using uh, passing electricity through the body panels to reduce uh, wiring complexity. You just use, you know, like we discussed prior, uh, common these days is a negative ground. So you have electricity running through all the panels in your vehicle. So as it gets wet, it gets salt or other other electrolytes on the system, it, you know, causes it to corrode more quickly. And that's not absolutely necessary for the process, mind you, but it does accelerate no, it, the process. It speeds it up, exactly. Without passing electricity through, you've still got basically a battery because you have two dissimilar metals and the conductive fluid. Yep. And and that was actually one of the things I was going to get to next, that this is basically how a battery works. Um, they are filled with acid so that's your your solution and they have a cathode and an anode and they produce electricity so um and like you said it's also uh the reverse of an electroplating process <laughs> now there's actually uh an anodic a, a, anodic scale um that the metals fall on so that you're trying to figure out which ones are the most negative um and like i said the most negative ones will suffer the corrosion uh they'll sort of be the sacrifice in the uh, in the process, and this is why um, they they bolt sacrificial anodes on the side of boats. Right, exactly. And in your water heaters in your house. For what it's yep. worth, I have an uncle who is a metallurgist who said that I should bolt them to the frames of my Land Rovers. It can help definitely, and zinc is one of the most negative, so that's often used as the sacrificial metal. And in fact, when you have something that's galvanized, that is basically zinc coated. So the zinc will corrode instead of the other metal. Now, if you have something like a galvanized chassis or, you know, on the Series Land Rovers, the body cappings are all galvanized and the, the windscreen frame, the, you know, steel that's that's underneath there, even if it gets chipped, the the zinc will take the the brunt of that. Bermabrite, which is uh, aluminum and magnesium uh, alloy, those actually fall between, you know, iron and steel and zinc on the, the scale. For the most part, in a series Land Rover, you don't have a whole lot of galvanized. Um, it's pretty much all bare steel or painted. And so the Bermabrite, which is the more negative, takes the brunt of that. And because it's a softer alloy, it can corrode pretty easily. But as I said, with, with galvanizing, um, that's actually 
you know, more negative than even Bright. So one way to get around it is to use, you know, a galvanized frame, uh, galvanized fittings, um, and that will make sure that the zinc takes the brunt of it. That's that's why you, uh, it's the best thing that you can do is assemble it with galvanized bolts, and the worst thing you could do is assemble it with stainless bolts. I've seen that mistake made so many times. People use stainless fasteners to put their truck together thinking, oh, they won't rust and I'll be able to get it apart later. The problem is that is so, so high on the galvanic scale that it eats the aluminum that it's bolted to. Guess what they used to assemble my 74 Series 3? <laughs> stainless steel. Of course they did. It's, because it's very thinks, common on the forum threads for people to suggest stainless steel. Yeah, everybody, oh, go get stainless. It's the way to go. No, it's not. It's the worst thing you can do. Exactly. Well, you guys know who put mine together, so. No comment. Wasn't me. Best thing you can do is is galvanizing. Um, and, in fact, there are, just to bring this all sort of full circle or tie it together, there are actually two processes for galvanizing. The most popular uh, is the hot dip galvanizing, where they're actually dipping the steel into molten zinc. Um, you actually can also do uh, electro galvanizing, which is an electroplating with zinc. Um, which is basically the reverse of the process. <laughs> One of the best things you can do is is use galvanizing for fittings and chassis. You can galvanize the bulkhead and the radiator panels. Again, the most common galvanizing is the hot dip, so that will actually uh, warp thin panels of which the bulkhead is uh, thin. Uh, what is it usually like? 20 gauge, it I believe. On which part of it you're talking about. The posts are relatively thick, but the well, foot, foot boxes are thin. Right, that's true. Most of the foot boxes and, and flat panels are fairly thin. But they, they'll twist a little bit, but you can usually straighten them out without too much work. Yeah, definitely. But it's something to be aware of uh, during that whole yeah. process. You will have some fitment issues when you go to put it together. But yep. They're not insurmountable. No, definitely not. Um uh, but yeah, you can do that. So you can basically galvanize all your steel. Um, you know, some people will still use, uh, you know, plastic washers between their metal washers um, against the panels just to, you know, further protect. If you're using all galvanized fittings, it probably doesn't really matter, but can't really hurt. In terms of repairing uh, Bermabrite panels, uh, there are some essentially solders, some filler materials that you can use to to patch holes. I actually don't have the one on my list that I had hoped to uh, to note, um, but I, I believe it was tested recently by the uh, uh, Ben from Fun Rover. He used it to test on some of his panels. I think we talked to him about that last month. It does work. Uh, you have to be very careful when doing any repairs on Bermabrite that you don't overheat it. It is aluminum. It will melt extremely quickly if you go over temperature. <laughs> and when it melts, it doesn't just, like, deform. It just ceases to be. Right. It's gone. <laughs> um, it evaporates? Well, it just, it, it just it, as quickly as you can think about it, all of a sudden there's this little bit of metal junk on the floor and a big oh, gaping hole where your yeah. panel used to be and nope. it just, right. it's not like it sags and runs it just like poof okay turns right. liquid and, or plasma yeah it's immediately it. a liquid it's it's pretty crazy as we said before you can anneal bermabrite um which is uh you know heating it slightly carefully uh, i believe the original suggestions are to use a torch set on a low temperature and to like rub a bar of soap on the uh, the panel, and and once you've heated it so much that your soap has uh, melted, that that that's it. Don't go beyond that. But that that allows you to get around work hardening. If you're doing patching, like I said, you can use fillers. You can actually get uh, fillers produced for the right uh, mix to TIG weld on Bermabrite. So that's some people do that. I honestly wish it was a little more common. And if you have any old Bermabrite panels, you can cut patches from those and sort of stitch them back together, weld them back together, TIG welding or using other fillers. Uh, but that's that's pretty much it and and why it's best to protect your Bermabrite panels as much as you can. A lot of people I've seen that will do field fixes just use rivets. Right, Mechanically exactly. connect them and, and call that good enough. And, and the nice thing about a series truck is if it's beat up and torn, who cares? It looks good that way. Yeah, and, and you know, rivets don't look out of place. 
it works pretty well if you have a hole like that. But if you have areas where panels fit with other panels or attached to the body, which obviously are the points where the galvanic corrosion uh, attacks the most, uh, you got to find some way to, to patch those, probably with something a little stronger than... Just covered up with bits. checker plate. You know, it's fine. <laughs> 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 totally. But in terms of like, you know, general body and, and frame upgrades, um, you can actually get new galvanized chassis. Um, that's what I got for my series Land Rover. I believe that the only company producing them at this point is probably Richards. There was one other company who now only makes uh, Defender uh, and other Land Rover chassis. You talking about Marsland? Oh, yeah. You know, maybe I have it backwards. I can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, Marsland and Richards were the two. And I think yeah, I think it is Marsland who only does Defender and other now. That's a, that's a new development. As of a couple, could, of, couple of years ago, they were still making series truck chassis. Yeah, it was in the last few years. Okay. Again, I could have it backwards that Richards is the one that is no longer. But as I well, recall, it's always an option to uh, find a decent one or patch one up and then get it galvanized. So. Absolutely, galvanizing is usually done by weight. Uh, it's more of a, an industrial process, um, so you you'll find that common in industrial areas. Um, I know that. Around us, it's hard to get galvanizing in Vermont, uh, but you go down into like Massachusetts and New Jersey, and you can find places who will do it. It's by weight usually, so you just sort of bring a chassis and as many other parts as you want, pay for the galvanizing, and you're you're done. The hard part is not necessarily just finding a galvanizer, but finding one with a tank big enough to dip the frame. That is actually true for the, the frames, yes. The bulkhead and the radiator panel are, are generally a no-brainer, but, but frames take a big tank. It's true. You have to dip uh, it all at once? You can't, like, dip one side and then turn it around? No, no, you, no, you no not so much. No. You want an even coat no. at the same time? Yeah, they have to make sure they actually do a chemical dip first to remove all purity or impurities, and then they do the the hot dip. Um, you also have to make sure that there are no air pockets that can be created in the whether it's a chassis or you know bulkhead or anything like that. Um, so you'll often be drilling extra holes to make sure that you can dip it without air pockets. Yeah, you want some actually want some drains so that you don't end up filling the frame with with zinc. <laughs> yes, that makes it much heavier. Does is zinc noticeably heavier? Does it add considerable weight? Oh, well, yeah. well, the point is, if you turn a tube into a solid bar, <laughs> right? No, I get that, but how 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 much heavier is zinc compared to you know the the bourbon braid itself? Is, is it double the weight? Is it? You well, you're, you're talking about steel at this point. A steel, not, sorry, not right. but but yeah, it's I don't know. It's, it's there is a difference, but it's noticeable. Yeah, I I, I know that uh, I've read about people that have had their frames dipped, and they didn't. Uh, drill the extra holes later on in life had accidents and they went ahead and cut the frame open and found out that their frame was half filled with zinc Sink. so that's yeah. got to add a couple hundred pounds at least yeah okay that's the end yeah, which then of course will affect your your mileage and all other issues okay that's what I was but like. But you're driving a Land Rover. <laughs> totally. Who cares? And, well, every, and, well, at that point, every, in some ways, maybe every every pound helps. Yeah. And at least it's in the chassis, so it's, you know, fairly low-sprung weight. But right. Right. <laughs> one safety tip uh, on, on galvanized metal is that it is highly toxic to breathe the fumes if you are heating or welding on it. Do not try to use, uh, you know, a a cutter or a welding equipment on uh, any galvanized metal without first stripping the galvanizing off the zinc coating. Important safety tip. Yeah, it, I've it is. been there. It's it's nasty stuff. Yeah, it's anything from you know acute sickness to death. It it can be deadly. <laughs> so important safety uh, tip. Yep. Definitely. Um, yeah. You can actually also get. Uh, there's a lot of people who do hybrid coilover conversions either modifying a chassis or, uh, you know, getting a Range Rover chassis, doing something like that. Lots of options. If you're doing that, obviously, you're doing something highly custom. So whatever you got to do, you're going to have to do some research and measuring and planning. That's always one to, you know, improve suspension at the same time you're improving your chassis. There are some other you know, small improvements you can make to, you know, the series. Defender door seals are popular. Uh, they seal much better than the series 
three door seals uh, or Series 2. And they're a lot cheaper. A lot cheaper. Yep, definitely. The heat is not great in Series Land Rovers nor really? the uh, <laughs> the defroster vents. So a lot of people would go with heated windscreens or uh, new heaters, various options there. Heated originally. seats. And heated seats, absolutely. $12 off of Amazon Prime. Amazon Basic heated seats, 12 bucks. Done. Yes, we best, should definitely always best thing I ever that. did. Yep. I saw a a, um, a post the other day on Facebook. Uh, some guy uh, set his dog alight or really some, something stupid. Someone's uh, heated seat, uh, cheap heated seat, uh, caught caught a light in his defender. Ouch! Yeah, That's horrible. Was, uh, his dog got injured a bit, and there was a there was a uh, some kind of a, a cushion on top of the seat as well, and that got burnt and. Uh, that could be part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. The, that's the problem with any heated seats like that. You are producing heat from electricity. If you have a short, yeah, things can go wrong. <laughs> yeah, and 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 invariably cheap is cheap. Yes, true. Uh, in terms of other upgrades, uh, you c- some popular door upgrades are the Rocky Mountain door tops, where you get improved double sliding windows for the Sears Land Rovers. Obviously, you can just take the door tops off if you're in such a climate. Uh, they also make soft windows, uh, door tops for the defenders, which will fit all sorts of things like that you can do. Insulation and sound deadening is popular. Again, it's going to add weight, but you know, Burmamite bright panels, what? What'd you're you just say? in an what? aluminum can. What? What'd you say? What? <laughs> I know, insulation, what's that? I can't hear you. Sorry, the engine's running. <laughs> I, I, I got to say, along those lines, the uh, molded rubber floor mat that they make for those is a phenomenal upgrade in terms of noise and, and comfort. Yes. And that, that's it's not cheap, but it's nice. No, it's not cheap. It is very nice. Um, and that uh, probably the same one that you're speaking of also covers the uh, seat box, which obviously also helps. Yeah. It's, it's, it's three pieces. It's a little piece for the, over the transmission on the on the bulkhead, and then it's the main floor, and then there's a separate piece for the seat box. Yep. And it's heavy grade rubber over top of acoustic foam, all molded to fit. Exactly, and those are great. Um, you know, Land Rover originally made some you know felt that you could install for insulation, and then put rubber over that. Obviously, a serious Land Rover is probably going to get wet, especially if you take it you know, off-road or anything like that, those newer insulation and sound deadening kits uh, are much more waterproof. Um, so much better to get something like that. As usual, because there were so many body styles, you can just swap over most things that you want to, to make it the way you would like. <laughs> uh, so you can sort of pick and choose. You know, there's the usual bumpers and uh, roof racks and, and such that you can install. One note, on the bumpers is that the bumpers on the series Land Rovers uh, actually bolt through the ends of the the chassis rails, um, so it's actually a very strong connection, uh, which is often not the case on some other off road vehicles. Yeah, the, the connection is far stronger than the bumper itself. Yes, definitely. I've, yeah. se- I've seen a few series truck bumpers that are V shaped from being pulled on. <laughs> Yes, I, uh, I saw one come off. Really, well, at the connection point, or you, or somewhere else? What, what do you mean it came off? The bumper came off the ch- from the chassis itself because mm-hmm. it wasn't. I think it took part of the chassis with it too. Okay, <laughs> uh, the the frame horns are a classic place for rust, so yeah, not the, entirely the lowest, surprising if it wasn't. They're the lowest point, so the muddy water collects there. Definitely, and they neglected to put a drain right next to it. <laughs> It's true. Yeah, the drain will get plugged anyways. Well, eventually they make their own drain. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and, yeah, you can get repair portions for the, you know, the, the frame horns there and the rear cross member. That's the sort of other common failure on the chassis. You can get replacement parts for all of those from numerous manufacturers. So a lot of that stuff can just be cut off and welded back on. Or if you know a good fabricator, he can just make that stuff for you. Absolutely. Or like I said, if you have the right gauge or pretty close gauge, as long as at least thicker, you can just cut it and weld it yourself. I've seen many people do that. Uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. There's a lot a lot there. And like we said, it's sort of a Meccano set. Build what you want, pair what you want. Works well. It's a, it's a good platform. And that's sort of where the Defender got its roots for its excellent platform. Yeah, I think, you know, when you, when you chat about this Meccano set sort of start of things, it's the one thing I really, really hope this new Defender 
is going to do, and that's have this bolt-on, bolt-off type of makeup. I don't think it's going to be that way. I think we're going to unfortunately have to suck it up and take the new panels and integrated uh, chassis and all the rest of it. But I hope they do something along those lines. They're going to be welded. They're going to be stuck together. They're going to be glued. You're they, not going to get bolt prob- on. probably won't be modular either. No. All the things that make a Defender a Defender. Yeah. They're probably, yep. they're probably going to be even plastic on there. Can you imagine? doesn't deserve the Defender name. Freelander had plastic body fenders in the front. It should be called the Pretender. The Pretender. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be what it'll nice. be. We shall soldier on. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Well, and, and truth be told, how many of us are going to go out and buy a brand new one? That's what I thought. I'd be the first yeah. one probably to get one of the, of, of the group here. And then I'm going to make you follow me down the trail. I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> I might lead the trail. <laughs> I, I wouldn't trail. Not it. <laughs> Thanks, Morgan, for this month's Heritage segment. What do we have on tap for next month? Uh, you know, I haven't decided. We'll probably have to move on to other vehicles like the Range Rover Classic or the D1. We could have accessories. Possibly. We could totally do accessories. Absolutely. Maybe the audience will tell us what they, where, where to go next. If you have an idea for our next, for starting our next Heritage segment, send it in and let us know. Yes, because listener contributions have been so useful to us in the past. They have. They have. Well, we're, we're working on it. We're working on listener contributions. I think we've identified every uh, listener contribution we've gotten. So uh, We do. Yeah. We, list, we do listen and identify yes. every Both listener. Both of them. <laughs> We've had more than a couple. We've had more than two. Thanks for listening today to the 34th edition of the Center Steer Podcast. I want to thank our panelists. Uh, thank you for joining us, gentlemen. And, hey, if any of you happen to make it out to the main winter romp on February 12th through the 14th, please stop by and say hi. I will be wheeling with everyone out there. Look for Dave, and you'll be driving what, Dave? I'll be driving my Blue 99D2. And are you towing it up? In, in I'll your... be towing it with my okay. very orange ram. <laughs> So it'll be hard to miss. Say hi to Dave, and I'm going to give Dave something to the first person that goes up to Dave and says, I listen to the Center Steer podcast. He's, uh, we'll give him a prize. So do that. Please stop and say hi to Dave. We're going to give a prize to the first listener that goes to, up to you. Damn, I think I need to go. And I also want to thank our guest uh, all the way from South Africa by way of Ireland and soon to be in Scotland is Craig from uh, MyLandRoverHasASoul.com. Thanks for joining us today, Craig. The confused South African. Uh, absolute <laughs> pleasure. It was great meeting you guys. You're not the first confused South African that we've met. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Graham, we're talking about you. There we go. I finally got my shot <laughs> Is in. Is that an oxymoron? <laughs> I remind you that we're part of the 4x4 radio network. Uh, I invite you to go out and check some of the other fine podcasts on the network, uh, the J Word, uh, Muddy Microphone, and uh, the 4x4 uh, podcast. Uh, who now was uh, Dan is now up in Alaska, and you can check out some of his exploits going on up there. Uh, we're approaching our third anniversary, and I invite you to go out and check out our website uh, for links to all the, sh- the discussion we've had today, to the various stories that's in the show notes. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Uh, but I think the best thing you can do, especially if you enjoy the podcast, is to tell your friends. Word of mouth is probably our best advertising. We enjoy doing the show pretty much just because we enjoy Land Rovers, nothing else. Does the podcast have a soul? Got a soul. Craig, Craig says it has a soul. Oh, and Craig, you're, you're officially declared friend of the show. <laughs> awesome. I hope you enjoyed listening to this month's show, where we'll talk to you again in a month's time to talk more about Land Rovers. And now, to honor the Defender, 67 seconds of silence. The Center Steer theme song, Sunset Rider by the Tritons, is available from Nibio's Music Alley. Check it out at music.nibio.com.
you dodge ram to a Land Rover meeting? <laughs> It, it's, what, it's what I use. It's what I use to tow my Land Rovers. Welcome to America, pal. I, <laughs>